This conference is brought to you by CodeStack, React and React Native development experts. Hello, welcome to our conference, React Native 2022. Powered, of course, by CodeStack, streaming live from, from beautiful Wrocław in Poland, where we have our headquarters. My name is Łukasz, and I'm a software developer at Colstack. And this year, I have a pleasure to be your host for the next two days. This conference is, of course, organized by Colstack, which is a React and React Native consultancy with deep root in open source space. We're based in Wrocław, but we are helping clients from all around the globe. If at any point during this conference you will think that this call stack company seems like a good fit for us and you want to hire us to do some work for you, or maybe you want to do some work with us and get hired by us, uh, you can find all the necessary information at the show description. Apart from the hard work that we are doing for our clients and for open source, we are also actively sharing our knowledge uh, with the community on our podcast, the React Native Show podcast, in which we are talking about the newest and greatest from React and React Native space. Uh, I host that one as well, so please do me a pleasure and go there and subscribe to our channel. Uh, you can find our podcast on our Colstack Engineers YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. Back to the conference. It wouldn't be this conference if it weren't for our sponsors, many of whom are actually here with us. And you will hear from them during the conference. So thank you very, very much. We couldn't do it without you. This event, just like the previous five times that we've done it, is a celebration of what has been achieved over the past few months in our React Native space. It's a celebration of an open source of collaboration and knowledge sharing spirit. So, in the spirit of collaboration and sharing, I'd like to invite you to join our Discord channel where you can ask questions to our prelegants, you can share opinions and experiences, um, you can do it on Discord, on Twitter, wherever you like. Uh, so please go to that link, and in the meantime, I will introduce myself there. Okay. Let's move on with our conference. So. For the next two days, we'll have a sneak peek into the React Native future. We'll have a chance to listen to experts from Meta, Microsoft, Shopify, obviously Colstack, and from many other companies and talented experts from the React Native community. To truly appreciate where we are now and where are we going, I think it's a good thing to look back to where we came from. So I'd like to share you a short story of mine, how I started with React Native a few years ago. So at the beginning, I had several people tell me not to go in, into React Native. I think it was the version around 40, and people were saying to me that JavaScript is not a real language, which is obviously not true. Uh, this is one of the biggest languages in the world right now, and we have TypeScript, we have other languages that very much bind with JavaScript. People were telling me that Apple and Google will just block React Native from their stores. That obviously didn't happen, and I don't think it will. They were telling me that this will never come close to React, uh, to real performance of real applications. Uh, this one thing we disprove at Callstack all the time. We, even on this conference call uh, talk, we'll have like five different talks about performance. 
So you can have your application written in React Native, it be performant at the same time. And one of the things that they were told me, uh, they were telling me, is that it will never be as useful or as versatile as real applications. So to that I say, uh, I cannot say because I have an NDA with clients, but we create all kinds of products. And those products benefit from React Native much more if they were written in just one single iOS or Android way. So, yeah. If any of you have those kind of friends, let us know on Discord. I really, I don't have that kind of friends anymore, but, yeah, let us know if anyone is saying about JavaScript, not a real language anymore. So, I also want to look at the React Native landscape back then at version 40 to stuff like that. Um, like I said, I was an Android developer back then, so manual linking was a real pain for me. It was a real pain point. Um, having to drag native binaries all over the Xcode was like a real magic. But fortunately, after a few months, after a few years, we have auto-linking right now. So like newcomers to the space don't have to worry about those things. Back in the day, if you wanted to do animations, you had to use animated API from React Native, which is quite limited. Uh, it's not the best. You know what is the best? Reanimated. You can just use open source library and the animations are performant, they're very well written, all that. This is actually something that I had real pain with. Uh, I was developing an application for 10-inch heavy Android tablet. And just imagine me shaking my tablet, trying to get my code to refresh. Uh, I actually created a workaround for this, so that when you tap three fingers on the tablet, it will re refresh then. But also, after a few months, I got this new feature in CLI, in Metro server, that you just need to press R to refresh. So, yeah. And this one is a stretch. But all over the React Native interviews, you hear this question, how do I make my flat list responsive? Why is it not performant enough? Uh, why do I have this white bottom when I scroll too fast? So to that I say, you can just use flash list right now. It's open sourced and we will hear about it on this conference as well. So, you're probably thinking, why am I saying all of this? Uh, you're probably thinking, he's old, he just wants to moan about olden days, how newcomers have easier than, than before. But no, that's not the reason. Actually, there is only one reason. And the reason is, I believe, our biggest strength is our community. I want you to join that community. Because if something is missing from React Native, someone will add it to React Native. If something is broken, someone has to report it, and someone will fix it. And if something requires a workaround, someone will create a better workaround. Uh, but we will get it done. We will get it done. So be a part of our community. Thank you. That was my speech at the beginning. And now, for someone who will have much more better things to say than I am about update for new architecture from Meta, Nicola Corti. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining this talk, either in person or live. 
uh, online. My name is Nicola Corti, and today I'm going to talk about bringing the new React Native architecture to the open source community, Fall Edition. If you were at AppJS, you might have seen this talk already, but we do have some updates, uh, things that got developed, uh, new capabilities, and things that we would love to share with you all. Mandatory slide about myself. Uh, I'm an engineer in the React Native team. You can find me online as Cortinico, either on Twitter, on GitHub. Feel free to send me messages, ask me questions. I'm more than happy to hear feedback. So let's jump straight into it because we have a lot to cover. If you were to search React Native new architecture today on, let's say, on YouTube, because if you want to check a video and see what's going on, uh, you will find actually a lot of content. And uh, I picked some talks, uh, which I think are representative of the new architecture as a whole. And you can see that the first one, it's from 2018. So the new architecture has been in the media for, for a while. And if you were at React Native EU virtually last year, my colleague Joshua gave this talk, which I invite you to, to pick up. It's about the new React Native uh, bringing the Fabric Render to the Facebook app. This is a story of how long it took for us. And well, as you can see from the dates, it took us some time. So the new architecture started in, in Q2 2018, at least from my researches. That's what I found out. And, and initially, it was accounted as a six months project. It turns out that, well, that's not the case. Because the Facebook app, it's um, using React Native quite extensively. And product developers have been squeezing all the possible performance gains out of React Native. So going and changing the engine of an airplane, which is going at hundreds of kilometers an hour, is not easy. So it took us nearly three years or so. And then we said, OK, so we rolled out. And the Facebook app is on your architecture. What do we do now? Well, now we need to tell the humans how to do it. And, and that's where the complexity starts. Because uh, we, luckily, have the opportunity to see the old code base and do changes, do breaking changes as we do, uh, and update the whole app. But that's not the same thing when we go in the open source. So that's where this talk starts. How do we actually let people outside of Meta use the capabilities that we developed. And so let me tell you about those capabilities. And if you are at this talk and you still haven't understood the reasons behind the new architecture, let me actually spend a couple of words on that. Because I keep on hearing sometimes people that ask me, but why you even did that? Well, it's first all about the bridge. Um, you probably know what I'm talking about, but there has been a lot of performance implications of having like JSON messages passed over. So the new architecture uh, has the goal of getting rid of the bridge, but at the same time, we also took the opportunity of rewriting a lot of the renderer and the internals of the framework using C++. Historically, we used to have different implementation between Android and iOS, which opened the door to a lot of discrepancies and bugs and things that were just behaving differently between the two platforms. This also allowed us to share new capabilities and functionalities with all the platforms just because we're going to develop them in C++. We don't need to re-implement them twice. Moreover, we took a stance at the developer experience perspective and we realized that developers tend to write a lot of boilerplate code, code that needs to deal with types. And so we thought, like, how about we create a tool that tries to get an input, a spec file, and auto-generates a lot of uh, this boilerplate. This allowed us to deliver type safety to our product. And also, um, you should think as the new architecture as the foundation for a lot of new capabilities that we will be releasing in the coming years. So. At first, you might feel like, oh, this is a lot of work for me to migrate, and what am I getting out of it? You will get new things that will be developed on the new architecture only. So what is the new architecture? 
We have some components which in the documentation you will find them referenced as pillars. And let me touch briefly on them. So first, we have the new renderer. And the code name for this is Fabric. Then we have a new native module system, which we call the Turbo modules. We do have a component which allows to generate a lot of codes to support those uh, pillars, which is called the code gen. And then we have a new um, way of starting the apps, which is called the bridgeless mode. So once everything has been migrated, we can effectively get rid of the bridge. Um, I, sadly, I don't have the time to deep dive into all of those. You will find docs online, but I want to touch on one of that, the code gen. Just to give you a glimpse of what's the vision behind this component. So the idea behind the code gen is we want you to write a spec file that describes the API of a component or a module. And from that file, we will generate code for you that will help you implementing it. So you will have a spec file, like in this case, I'm creating a native module, and I'm declaring that I want something which is able to answer the ultimate question, which takes an input, a string, and returns a number. And I will register it. So the, the key part here is this. So what the code does, it takes an input, this spec file, it analyzes this function and understands that it's a function called answer the ultimate question as an input type, a return type. From that, we can generate platform specific code. So let's take a quick look at it. On Android, what we're going to generate is uh, this native answer solver spec. Uh, which implements like turbo module and so on as a constructor and it offers an abstract method called answer the ultimate question which takes a string in Java and returns uh, a double. So this is abstract. So the idea here is that we generated this for you, you don't need to generate that, you will just have to, well, write what is the ultimate, uh, the answer to the ultimate question. So you just have to implement this method. On iOS, the situation is similar. So we create a protocol with, again, same function. We uh, convert the JavaScript or TypeScript types to the platform-specific one, and then we leave you the, uh, the deal to implement the business logic. Um, so with the new architecture, it comes like a lot of new infrastructure pieces in the equation, which we had to, we had to add and we had to adapt. And I want to touch briefly on build tools. Uh, just because it's a topic that is close to me, and I really like it, and I want to expose you to some of the yeah, complexities that we are adding and we are trying to also encapsulate and make your life easier. As you probably know, at Meta, we build everything with Buck. Uh, but we can't pretend that you will use also back in your open source projects. So we had to adapt all of our open source pipelines to be able to invoke the code gen and understand that there is also C++ code and so on. So how, how, did, how did, we, did we do this? So on Gradle, uh, on Android, we extended our Gradle configuration. So for example, uh, you will see that there is C++ code. As I was saying before, we do have a core now which is written in C++. We allow also user to write modules which are C++ only. So there is some C++ code that needs to be compiled at a certain point. So you will start seeing CMake files or headers files and so on. Again, the feedback that I hear from a lot of people is like, I'm a web engineer. I don't want to hear about C++. Um, so we are trying to encapsulate as much as possible these complexities by still allowing you to go heavy and write C++ code if you want. So you know that it's under the hood, but you're not supposed to touch it. Like you should live your life happily without knowing it. For Java uh, and Kotlin, we actually took a stance and encapsulated all the new architecture logic inside the so-called React Native Gradle plugin. This is a collection of tools that allows us to build Android apps and plug all the React logic uh, needed. So historically, you might have seen a file called react.gradle, which was just like imported and included everywhere. Uh, the new React Native Gradle plugin is going to replace that file in the future and will also contain all the logic to handle the code gen as more tests. It's like the next generation of Gradle logic. 
On iOS, we did a similar work on the Cocoa Pods side of things. So we do have a custom logic files uh, written in Ruby. We also spent quite some time writing tests for those. So, well, like again, what I keep on hearing from the community is that like updating React Native versions is hard. And one of the reasons is because we had a lot of infrastructure code which was untested, was unclear what it was doing. So with the new architecture, we actually took a stance and looked at those files and try to like reorganize them and make them also easier to integrate with all the possible scenarios you might have. I also want to touch a little bit on Hermes because you might find it referenced in the new architecture documentation. If you're not aware of Hermes, it's our in-house uh, built JavaScript engine and you will find it recommended for the new architecture. So as of now, whenever you report a bug, if it's a bug related to Hermes, and the new architecture, it, trust me, there will be more people looking at that. If you use the new architecture without Hermes, technically you can still use it, it's recommended, it's not like required, uh, but please consider using it. If you can't use Hermes, please tell me why. I will make sure that the right person uh, receives that feedback. And from version uh, 69 of React Native, we actually shipped a change called bundled Hermes. This means that um, every version of React Native contains a version of Hermes which is known to be fully compatible with that version of React Native. For example, here you will see that the engine is Hermes for React Native 69. The reason why we did that is because um, React Native and Hermes are tightly coupled and compiling them in an isolated way exposed us to a lot of runtime crashes and problems and this helps us both us and the Hermes team to fully understand if there are incompatibilities between the two frameworks. As of React Native 070, which is going to be out really, really soon, uh, Hermes will be the default engine for React Native. So historically it was not, now it will be. So when you create a new project, it will be on Hermes unless you want to disable that. Again, if you need to disable that, let us know. Back to new architecture couple of changes that we also took a stance at looking into it, which was highly requested, is modern languages. We keep on hearing from the community that you want to use TypeScript. And uh, well, if you looked at the first iteration of the new architecture docs, which were released in December last year, uh, the number one comment is like, I don't want to use Flow to write my specs. Literally, like I don't want to have a fully TypeScript project with just one file written in Flow. So I'm happy to share that the Cogen, um, the React Native Cogen supports TypeScript, so you can write your spec in TypeScript as well. Uh, it's a work in progress. Internally at Meta, we use the Flow version, so do not expect the same level of battle testing that we do with the Flow Cogen. But again, uh, there has been like involvement also from the community to extend the TypeScript Cogen. And again, if you have problems, just let us know. On Android, um, well, it's all about Kotlin, which is a language that I personally really love. And it's fully supported in React Native. You can write your React Native new application up with Kotlin. There are no known incompatibilities. We also spent uh, quite some time updating the website to be bilingual. So now on the React Native website, you will find docs for Java and Kotlin side by side. Here I linked an issue, uh, which is like, a, like an umbrella issue where you can contribute and uh, update the last pages which are missing, which don't have yet the Kotlin uh, equivalent for the Java snippets. And you might expect the template, the new app template to be migrated to Kotlin at a point in future. We don't have a date for these, but the whole Android ecosystem is moving in this direction. It just makes the code smaller, easier to maintain, and so on. And on iOS, well, on iOS, we are looking into it. It's a harder discussion, happy to chat about it like later, uh, but sadly we don't have uh, updates to share at this stage, but we, we hear that people want to write Swift, uh, so yeah, we're looking into that. I also want now to give an update on timeline and versions, so when things happen and what happened when. 
So the first version of React Native to fully support the new architecture is React Native 68. Actually, the new architecture was released a little bit earlier, so some apps or libraries might try to use it in some form. Uh, but 68 is the first version where the template offers a simple flag which turns on all the logic to try the new architecture. So you need to be on the version if you want to try it in a human feasible way. Then we have 69. Uh, in 69, we ship a couple of changes. Uh, as I said before, bundled Hermes and also React 18. Um, I will uh, dive into React 18 a bit later, uh, but yeah, it's quite of a significant change of React, and si React Native 69 is the first version of React Native which comes with uh, React 18. So if you want to use the latest version, you need to be on that one. Then we have React Native 70, which, as I said, is going to be out really, really, really soon. And yeah, here are a lot of changes again. Uh, Hermes is now the default engine, and we do have a couple of other changes specifically related to the new architecture. First, auto-linking. As Lukas was saying during the uh, keynote, well, auto-linking is, is a game changer. And the reality was that auto-linking was not working on Android for new architecture because we have also C++ code. Uh, this has been uh, developed by Coldstack, thanks for doing that, and uh, is now shipped in uh, 70. So you're free to use it. It will work completely transparently, so you will not have to do anything. It will just work out of the box. Uh, we shipped support for CMake. So we, historically, we used to use a file called android.mk to let you configure how the native build should work, which was kind of black magic. Uh, no one knew how to work, like how that worked. Now we use CMake, which is a little bit uh, more user friendly. And also another requested feature was the unified code gen config. So historically, in 68 and 69, the code gen needs to be configured differently between Android and iOS, like in two different files, which went out of sync quite easily and so on. Now with 70, we fixed this issue, and this is easy for everyone, so, so on. So my recommendation is, if you look into the new architecture, 70 is an amazing version to start looking into it. And then, what's next? Well, we have 71. And I want to give a sneak peek of what we have on main, because this is merged, so you can just go there and check it out. Uh, we are taking a stance at simplifying the template. So, the, the, the new app project, which you have as soon as you do React Native in it, uh, it's quite complicated. There are a lot of things which you don't necessarily need, need to be exposed to, and we took a stance, then we cleaned them up, a lot of them. Uh, specifically, with 68, the template grew quite a lot because we had to add a lot of new architecture logic, and in 71, we started like see how much we can like, you know, simplify it, and reduce it so it's not as scary as it was before. And more to come, which uh, it's not merged yet. So uh, keep an eye on main to know what's, what's coming. And, and yeah, in 72, who knows? Uh, to the infinity and beyond. And I'm actually extremely excited because today we are in five from Meta and we are so keen and eager to hear your feedback. So if you try the new architecture, if you add struggles, if you add problems, please stop us and tell us, hey, this doesn't work for me because you folks changed everything and so on. So we don't want to ship breaking changes. We want to make this experience as great as possible. And we can do so by hearing what you feel is working or not working for you. So React 18, I briefly touched on that new major feature of React, and if you go on the blog post which my colleagues wrote uh, on the React blog, you will find a thing called concurrent React. And new APIs like start transition and so on, which you might want to use. Well, it's crucial to understand that if you are on React Native 67 or React Native 68, you are essentially on React 17. 
even if you go on your package.json and change the version of React, at runtime, you will still be running on React 17. The version, the, the way how React and React Native are version is tightly coupled. So React Native decides which version of React to consume. With 69, 70, and so on, you can actually use React 18. Uh, but where is the catch? The concurrent React feature and those new APIs, start transition, and so on, they have been built on top of the new architecture. So it means that you need to be on the new architecture to use concurrent React. If you are on the old architecture, you are essentially using a legacy mode of React, which it's fine for now if you keep on updating your React version, React Native version, but you should start considering the new architecture. There is no better time to migrate your app than now. Because now we are looking at the ecosystem, we are looking at the migration path, we are looking at user reports. In one year from now, this might not be the case anymore. So don't be late. OK, so that being said, I hope I convinced you to take a look at the new architecture because now I want to touch on docs and material. So what do we have ready for you? And yeah, here, to quote Colstack again, this episode of the React Native show, uh, they were mentioning on how it's basically all about the docs. Like, the new arc is there, but if no one tells me how to use it, well, that's going to be a challenge. So that's why we spent a lot of time to create documentation and material to let you understand how to embrace the new architecture. Uh, first, the official docs. So on reactnative.dev, you will find a new section called the new architecture in the guides. Uh, this has been reshaped and rewritten and extended multiple times. And again, we want to hear feedback. It explains you those concepts that they're briefly touched and uh, hopefully it will give you all the necessary instructions to update your project to use this. And uh, we also have another section called migrating to the new architecture, which contains specific instructions on how to migrate either your library or your apps. We also have a new section called architecture, without new, on top, which we are starting to populate, and it contains deep dives and technical documentation on the framework. This has been highly requested because over the years, the only way to understand how things worked was to read the code or to find a, a Facebook engineer and ask them like, how it works. So there you will find documentation on uh, specifically how the renderer works, and uh, we actually spent time creating diagrams and try to explain as much as possible how the internals work. Again, if those are not clear, if things are missing, let us know. Um, as, I, as I said before, uh, I talked about the new app template, and we believe this is a great entry point to experience the new architecture. When you do uh, NPX React Native in it, you are exposed to a new project, and we spent time on updating it so that trying the new architecture is as easy as flipping a switch. And how do you flip the switch? On iOS, that happens at pod install time. So normally, you will do pod install. And to try the new architecture, you can just uh, do that using this environment variable, RCT, new arc enabled equal one, and just run your app. And that will be a new architecture app running in your iOS simulator. On Android, the experience is similar. We do have a file called Gradle properties. Uh, which contain a property called new arc enabled, which is set to false by default for now. And you can just change it to true and run it with React Native run Android. To be sure that everything is running fine, uh, Metro will tell you which are the uh, starting parameters, and you will see that fabric is set to true and concurrent root is set to true. So this means things got passed by, the render got it, and yeah, the magic is happening. Other material that might be helpful for you. We started a working group. This uh, started from the experience we had with the React 18 working group, and is a discussion only uh, repository, which allows you to interact with other people which are touching the new architecture, and also ask questions and deep dive. Uh, you will find specific sections on like libraries, 
documentation, and so on. Uh, the group at first might look closed, but there is an invite link that you can follow on the home page. Fill in the details, and we will add you to the group just after. And then we have samples, because we believe that docs are great, but if I can give you a sample app or something that you can touch with your hands and build and see how it works, that is also great content. So we do have a sample repository called RN New Architecture App, which contains a collection of branches, and every branch explains how our app has been migrated from a version of React Native to another and enabling the new architecture over there. We also took a stance and documented step by step every commit that we did, providing instructions on how to do that. And trust me, I was migrating a library this morning and I was reading this, so it's great stuff. Uh, we also have an equivalent repository for libraries, which contains a similar approach, but from a library perspective. So how can I create a library which uh, it's compatible with both the old and the new architecture, so I can cover all the user base of React Native. I also want to call out a couple of libraries which already started migrating, uh, or already migrated and released a new version. We truly believe that this is a migration that we're gonna all do together. So what we are looking at is friction points and how we can smooth them out. But library authors need to be on board on this and needs to, be under, needs to understand the importance of this migration and what are the steps needed. And if there are blockers, please, again, tell us. And now, to wrap up, I really hope that in six months from now, in a year from now or so, when I will search React Native New Architecture, I will read your migration story and you will tell us how great we did or how badly we did. Like, I'm, I'm happy to any kind of feedback. And really, we are here to hear your migration story, hear what doesn't work, and hear what works well. Uh, Meta has, is fully committed to open source and to building this together. So like, we really want to hear what is going on and what works well and what not. And with this, I first want to thank you very much for listening, and I want to recall that contributions are more than welcome, not only on React Native, but all on the family of frameworks we develop, Metro, Hermes, React, and so on. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Nicola, so much. So I love sp speaking with Nicola because every time we speak, he has something new to say about new architecture. So I'm looking forward to the next version of this talk, winter edition. Uh, probably some new exciting topics there. Our next speaker from Microsoft talking about changing React Native from within, Adam Foxman. Hello, and thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm going to be taking you on a journey of how, at Microsoft, we're uh, changing React Native from within. I'm Adam Foxman. I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft. I've been uh, doing software for about 25 years. And the last five years, I've been working exclusively on React Native and with JavaScript technology. And it's been an interesting change from 20 years of C++. And the community around all this new technology and JavaScript has really gotten me excited and involved. And I am becoming a DevRel enthusiast, loving communicating and working with all the various wonderful, smart people out there. So Microsoft is heavily invested in React Native. It's a, it's a huge part of our technology stack. Uh, we've been investing in it for years. Uh, we build the desktop products for React Native, the platforms for Windows and Mac OS. Um, and we use these in a lot of apps that we ship or we, we blend in experiences using these desktop technologies. And we ship them on mobile devices, tablets, desktops. Um, 
and you can see some of the product logos here. I mean, this stuff is hitting Office. It's in Windows. It's in Teams. It's in Xbox. It's in a lot of places. And so it's a big part of what we do, and that's why I'm here today to talk about it. What we found is that at the scale that we're working in with the really complicated products that we're bringing React Native to, the developer experience doesn't scale that well. Uh, the first area I wanted to touch on there is dependency alignment and compatibility. Um, and what I mean by that is alignment specifically, um, at Microsoft we have a lot of mono repos with lots of different libraries and uh, packages and huge numbers of dependencies, and there are a few of these monorepos. So getting our dependencies aligned within a monorepo is important because if you don't have things lined up, you tend to have duplicate packages showing up in your app bundles. Uh, one example is if you use a library that uses React Date Time Picker, and a lot of your apps are pulling that library in and sharing it, and then one of your apps separately uses React Date Time Picker, but a slightly different version to get newer features, uh, you're gonna, you could have two copies of this thing showing up because you're pulling in an older version and a newer version. Yarn hoisting and PNPM isolation sort of really cause this. And I mean, in the best case scenario, your bundle gets too big. But in the worst case scenario, if there's global state involved, having two copies of a, a, a package in your app is, is bad news. And on the compatibility front, this is really about uh, making sure that the version of React Native you're using, the core version, lines up with all those React Native libraries that are common to a lot of the apps we're building. You know, as React Native changes over time from 6.4 to 6.5 and 6.6, there are significant changes, some of them are breaking, and all those libraries that we come to depend on, they need to be upgraded too. And if you're on 6.4 upgrading to 6.8, that's a big change. And which version of the gesture handler are you going to use? And which version of reanimated are you going to use? Th that stuff isn't really published. Those libraries don't really go back in time and have little tables that tell you if you're upgrading from here to here. You just choose this version. Of it. So that's been a real challenge, because if you get that wrong, your apps break. Uh, another area where we found the dependency, uh, the developer experience doesn't scale is in bundling performance and, and feature set. Um, Metro is fast. It's, it's a little bit faster than Webpack from our experience, but it's missing a lot of key features. And I'm going to go into what some of those are uh, more later. And um, another challenge for us is that TypeScript is a big part of our quality gate. It's, it's a big way that we ensure quality across all these libraries and packages. And it's just not really part of the core developer experience when you're using React Native. You can use it, you can add it, but it's, it's somewhat difficult. And these things sort of combine to slow down the engineering experience. And that's what I mean when I say it doesn't scale, is that really at the end of the day, the work that we're trying to do as engineers is hampered by some of these challenges. And so we're working to change the status quo. We want to make things a little bit better or a lot better if we can. And how do you do that? Well, the first step that we're taking is we want to make a substantial contribution. And we are. We're, we, we're shipping these desktop platforms. We ship a lot of libraries and open source. And um, separately from the technology side, we have partnerships with a lot of key players in the React Native space. And you know, through those partnerships, we are learning and engaging and trying to understand where things are headed and how we can contribute in a way that's going to help the community and uh, you know, not work against the direction that the majority of folks are headed. And you know, working directly with the community, too, through uh, pull requests and our engagement in React Native Core and other libraries and things, that keeps things engaged for us and, and helps us understand you know, how we can move things in the right direction internally at Microsoft so that we're staying in line with what is going on in the rest of the world. Um, and the third area to really make a big change like this that, that I'm going to be talking about in, in the rest of this talk is core contributions, um, especially to React Native Core and a lot of the libraries that are fundamental to building apps. You need to be uh, involved in all that stuff. You need to be filing issues and PRs and 
we do that, and we, we, we run a lot of them through our own testing infrastructure. We, we contribute a lot of type information out there so that TypeScript works, and we even co-pilot a lot of releases. And so we're doing this because we want to build a set of modern scalable tools that create an exceptional developer experience. Uh, the real focus is to make React Native even more fun, easier to use, making it good for everyone through the, the types of things we want to put out in the world and, and, and build. You know, it, it helps our, us internally, but realistically we are more interested in joining the, the larger community and making sure we're participating and, and helping to bring goodness to everyone. And so that's kind of the theme of this talk, which is that a rising tide lifts all boats. It's a, an old adage, but it's really at the core of what we're trying to do. Uh, software really has a tremendous amount of leverage. Um, a few of us together can impact the experience that many people around the world using React Native have. And so we want to be the moon here. We want to influence the tide. We want to lift all boats simultaneously with positive change that's going to be really helpful and good for everyone. But what are the specific challenges that need to be addressed, right, in this space to really see this vision come to fruition? Like, what are the things that we're working towards fixing specifically? Uh, on the apps and experiences front, adding React Native to an existing app, that's a lot of what we do. That's really hard to do. Um, there's always a nice, simple slide at various talks about how starting up a new app is fun and easy and cool when someone did it to, to do an amazing thing to track COVID information or, you know, and th those are really awesome and powerful things, but in the world of 30-year-old applications like Office or Windows, you know, bringing React Native to an app like that, an app that moves somewhat slowly so that you can iterate on certain experiences more quickly and reach your users more, more often, you know, that's a harder challenge. And there is a guide out in reactnative.dev. And it's, it's really helpful, but it's kind of one size fits all. And the guide doesn't really teach you what it's doing. It just sort of, it does what a guide does. It takes you from the start all the way through to the finish line, step by step. And, you know, in Office, that, that's probably not going to work because the UI stack is really weird and old and complicated and... Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of challenge there, so it's easy to go off course. The more complicated your native app, the, the harder it is. And really, I'm talking about this because it's a barrier to entry for people who want to come into this world and aren't really, don't really have the benefit of using React Native just as a, a greenfield, a brand new app. Um, there, there are probably quite a bit of these that I think a lot more people we can reach if, if we make this a little bit smoother. Another area where we, um, another like challenging area for us is staying up to date. And what I mean by this is package versions. You know, NPM, I feel like it's moving a mile a minute. There's always a package being released somewhere and we all probably depend on it somehow, whether it's the 10th layer or the first layer. <laughs> um, at Microsoft, we have monorepos with over 5,000 external dependencies. And it's really difficult to keep track of these things and make upgrades because any package change has a ripple effect through the whole repo, through all the libraries and all the apps. We, we might ship hundreds of libraries out of a mono repo and a handful of apps, and those libraries go into other mono repos and get shipped in other apps. And so it's kind of like this really complicated, tangled web. And upgrading without breaking compatibility is a real challenge. I, TypeScript does help. We, we use TypeScript at scale. It's been an amazing quality gate for us, but it doesn't really catch these, at least in large numbers. And so what you need to do is test. And then you need to test again, go home, come back on Monday, and keep testing, because that's the only way you're really going to find most of the bugs uh, and really understand that your compatibility when you bump a version of a particular package is still good. Inner loop, this is, I call this the inner loop, but I don't know if there's other names for it. 
as developers, this is when you get an idea, you write the code, you check it in, you, your PR lands, and then you do it all over again. That needs to be faster. It needs to be smoother, it needs to be easier. And at scale, when you have so many packages in a mono repo and, and libraries that you're working on, um, it's kind of slow. Uh, well, at least it feels slow. It feels like it could be faster. Uh, one area where this is especially painful is there are these cool new native equivalent tools coming out for things that we have been, all of us have been using node tools for. So things like bundlers or Babel, now there's SWC and there's ES Build. This is probably something a lot of you have already seen. ES Build is written in Go, it's fast. And this benchmark is showing you that for a normal common bundling workload, in half a second, ES Build does what Webpack takes 40 seconds to do. So it's over 100 times faster. And when I'm sitting there waiting a few minutes for a bundle to run, this benchmark is coming, running through my head. Why, why am I waiting? And so like, what, what is commonly accepted is really kind of bugs me all the time that why can't we have this, right? It's another area where we run into scalability challenges is with haste. Um, haste is part of React Native, whether you've heard of it or not, it's, it's in there. And it's a really interesting alternative module resolver. Uh, primarily used internally at Meta, They're, they have a lot of cool infrastructure that makes use of it. I don't think many of us in the rest of the world have that infrastructure or benefit from it. Uh, but there is a part of haste that really kind of gets in the way and it's called the crawl phase. And if you don't know, when you first bundle after uh, changing your dependency graph, Metro will uh, look through all your source code, load up all the files, and then it'll look through all the source code of all your dependencies, like everything in your repo. Every last file gets loaded, parsed, indexed, and put into an in-memory database so that haste can say, oh, you, you asked for this module? Oh, it's over here, or wherever that source code is. But um, for the most part, it's not used, yet we all still have to pay the price of a crawl. And so crawls happen with Watchman, which is kind of fast. It's, it's native code, but it's, it still takes up gigs of memory, or Node, which is really slow. Um, and so this is an area where I think we can make some inroads and make this a little bit more optional. Metro is an awesome bundler, and it's missing some key features. Um, the number one issue, or well, the very first issue filed, against Metro years ago is that symlinks don't work. And there's a good technical reason for this. Uh, it has something to do with Watchman and the way that it traverses symlinks or, or can't traverse symlinks. But for the most part, you can make Metro work in a symlinked environment, like specifically if you use PNPM, you're going to have symlinks in your node modules. Or if you um, use yarn link, for example, you'll, you'll have an occasional symlink here and there. And you can make Metro work with it, but it still hasn't been addressed, and it's, it's a bit of a problem. Tree shaking is not something you can work around. Tree shaking, if you don't know, is eliminating dead code. Um, as a C++ developer originally, this is like the linker just does this for you, right? You, you link a bunch of files together, and it only keeps the code that you're actually using in your final executable. But for, in the JavaScript world, the equivalent is, think of it like you're importing something really big and complicated like Lodash, where there are all kinds of cool features and functions and spanning the gamut of anything and everything you might want to do at a language level. And you only use maybe two or three of them. The other 150 should be thrown away, they, but they don't. They, they, they come into your app bundle and they get shipped to all your customers and they just sit there and don't do anything. And so. You know, dead code elimination, you can think of it as um, small bundles good, big bundles bad. <laughs> and, and tree shaking works on, it typically works on require boundaries, so if you require only two or three of those functions and they don't pull much else in, um, then it can understand that, oh, the rest of it's just not needed. I, no one's actually importing this, so I can just throw it out. And in the inner loop TypeScript, uh, is 
absent. It's kind of missing from what I call the key React Native workflows. So um, bundling or using your IDE, like TypeScript is there, but it doesn't quite have enough intelligence to really tell you what's going on in, in the terms of React Native, like the idea of platform is missing. And so it's just, it's essential for large projects and it, it holds back your ability to sort of increase your scale. So that's a lot of complaining, right? What does it actually look like to succeed? Um, so from a developer's point of view, when you read this list, upgrades should be safe, they should be easy. You should be able to change a package version, you should be able to upgrade React Native or the gesture handler or reanimate it or something and just trust that it's going to work and you don't have to think about it beyond that. You shouldn't have to spend hundreds of hours doing testing and detailed compatibility analysis. And, and bundlers, the bundlers that you use should be fast and there should be some kind of extensibility model because um, the folks who build Metro are really smart but they just can't think of everything because there's only a handful of people. You know, Webpack's a really good example of this. The ecosystem that they've enabled is just amazing. There's, there's an infinite number of plugins for anything and everything you would want to do and maybe some things you don't want to do. But we, we need something like that in the Metro world because Metro is the, the primary way to be bundling React Native apps. And um, with Hermes, uh, things just get more and more interesting. And so we're focusing on Metro uh, specifically at, with a lot of the work that we're doing. And TypeScript, if you use it, I would recommend that most people do, but you know, it's, it's optional, but it should be there. When you want it, it should be easy to use. It should be a first class citizen. It should just start working. It should show up everywhere that you do development so that bugs and code don't escape your development machine unless everything's clean. Like why let it get into a PR? Why let it land in master or main? And uh, sort of a, a not so intuitive thing that contributes to success is uh, we need to have more PRs landing in the core libraries, the React Native core itself and the libraries that we all use. Uh, I think there's a lot of friction trying to get things contributed and it's not for lack of trying uh, on the part of the folks who own the repos and the part of the folks who are contributing the code. It's just a hard challenge and I don't think we're spending enough time in that space, but we need to create a bit of a virtuous cycle where we can collaborate together, build and ship stuff often and land PRs so that other people see that it's, it's possible and it's, you don't need to have friends in high places to really get a PR through. And this will bring uh, new ideas from places where maybe they haven't been surfacing. Um, so just sort of a, a way to engage the community and expose the idea that anyone can really successfully get a PR through. I, th I think that's really important to a successful, healthy, virtuous ecosystem around React. And so one of the things that we're doing at Microsoft is we're building a set of React Native developer tools that we call RNX Kit. And this is a repo that we made about a year and a half ago. There are three of us working on it, so it's a funded project. And so far we have about 30 release packages. There are five incubating packages, things that we're working on that aren't quite ready to escape yet. Um, we have two test apps, you know, um, one expo, one not, so we really make sure that we're trying to keep in line with what the rest of the world is doing. And we have a bunch of active issues and even an RFC. And so this repo is focused on developer experience. It's first and foremost, it's a community project. We created it out on GitHub and we started taking a lot of the internal tools that we had been building and using for a while. And we really wanted to move those out into the world and. Um, make them available to people and also invite contribution and saying, you know, does this work for you? And if so, great. If not, can you please help us make it better? 
Um, these are tools that are written by developers for developers. So, you know, people who have experienced the pain firsthand, uh, we wrote these tools to try and alleviate that pain. And one of the benefits of having this be something that we started at Microsoft but really have made it a community project is that we still get to test it at scale. We get to use it. We get to build these tools, take them in-house to these repos that are massive, and really see them fail and iterate on the tools until we get them right so that there's a really good chance it's going to work for you when you, when you pick it up. This isn't just something we've thought up and tried out. These are actually really well uh, tested. And we use these tools to ship apps to millions and millions of customers. So it doesn't mean they're perfect. So uh, we really need people to come and contribute and, and tell us, you know, what's, what else do you want it to do? Because we, we're funded. We're ready. We, we want to we align with what the community is doing. So let's get on and, and actually meet these tools. What am I, what am I actually talking about? In, in the dependency space, we have a tool called Depth Check. And this thing made an appearance at last year's conference. Um, it is just an awesome app. And it's kind of our solution to the problem that I was talking about earlier of duplicate packages showing up in an, in an app bundle and the compatibility issues with React Native and the libraries for React Native. As you know, they need to move in lockstep so that you keep things compatible. Depth Check really the way it works is it, it, it comes with this magical database inside. And I say magical because it kind of is like magic. It's a, this, think of it as like per React Native version going back about a year or two, maybe even two or three years. It's a list of all the dependencies that we use in all our apps and the versions that we know we have tested really to death. The, uh, Understanding like NetInfo and async storage and reanimated and gesture handler and daytime picker and clipboard and so on. Which versions of these guys really are compatible with 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, So that when you are ready to move from, say, 6.4 to 6.6, you can run depth check in an automated way and it will update all your dependencies and tell you, oh yeah, you can trust it. We've, we've shipped apps already knowing that that information is correct. And it will just move your dependencies along. So you can focus on changing your code to match the, the new requirements of React Native 6.6 from 6.4 to 6.6. You don't have to sit there and try and guess, oh, which version do I need to use here? Is that really going to work? Should I test it? No, everything's done. And it's extensible. You can, you know, we have a set of libraries that we use. If you have additional libraries that you use or you have different constraints, you're, you can add them easily to depth check. Another tool we're building, it's not really a tool, it's a collection of tools. It, it's about enhancing Metro. And the first way we do that is with Simlinks. So um, we have a, a package that very simply adds Simlink support to Metro. So if you use PNPM or Soon, if you use NPM in isolation mode, which is kind of like what PNPM does, that's going to be coming out in the next few months, I think, you can just, Simlinks will just work for you automatically. You, have, you don't have to do anything. And we added TypeScript validation to Metro. So when you bundle, if there's any type errors, you wouldn't normally hear about them, but now you'll get output that's familiar, right? You'll, you'll see the, the colorful errors, You'll get all the information about what's broken, and you can fail the bundle. So this is really handy if you use TypeScript as a quality gate when you are running React Native in CI and you're bundling, your CI loop can just fail and say, no, you've introduced type errors. You probably broke something. Go back and take a look. And as a bonus, the, the TypeScript checking that we do is platform specific which is kind of interesting because the way the React Native types are set up today, view props, which is like really common, it, it unifies Android and iOS types. So you can't really tell if there's something unique to iOS or something unique to Android. You can't really tell if you're using a property that's not really going to work. But um, if you're using Microsoft's Fluent UI React Native library, those things get separated back out. 
and you can actually see, oh, you're using an iOS prop, but you're using it in an Android app. It's probably not going to even do anything. Are you sure that's right? You might want to take a look at that. And so the way we've integrated TypeScript with Metro, you, you'll start to find those issues that you might not know that you have. Tree shaking. This is like super easy to use and really handy because it will immediately shrink your bundle and get rid of a bunch of stuff that you probably don't need. Um, so it's, it's an easy win and it's fast because we use ESBuild to do it. On the tail end of every time you bundle, tree shaking will just run. And we added a plugin system to Metro and we created two plugins. The first one will tell you if you have duplicate packages in a bundle, which I don't think there's anything else out there that will do that unless you're in the Webpack world. And so you might be surprised by what you find when you first run this. Uh, and there's also one to detect cycles in your package graph, which is a little less common, but it can lead to deadlocks. So here's what it looks like. Um, in the first example, there's React IS is just appearing twice. There's two different versions going into a single app bundle. And, Metro failed because you don't want duplicates. You, you don't want a bigger bundle. You don't want to risk having state errors and compatibility problems. And in the second one, there's uh, a cycle where the, a package logger brings in FS utilities probably to write to a log file, which then brings in file appender. And then file appender uses the logger to write messages. And so you can get into a require loop that, that could deadlock your app. And the third and final tool I'm going to discuss with you today is the the command line interface, we've, we've added a bunch of new commands to the React Native CLI uh, to extend it to sort of wrap up all these tools and give you sort of a comprehensive scriptable interface to using them. There's a little hard to read, but we have uh, all these commands start with RNX. And there's a bundle command, a start command, one for depth check, uh, one to clean out your repo, and so on and so forth. And these are really task-oriented scripted commands, scriptable commands that you can use in CI or on your command line. And they're, they're really focused on helping you get work done and also looking and feeling like the tasks you already use. Um, there's a little bit of a twist. We add this idea of configurable defaults. This is, think of it as, um, you know, all those command line parameters for, for bundling, like the entry file and the name of the source map file and all that good stuff, those kind of appear in a bunch of places. They appear in package JSON scripts, they appear in CI scripts, they might appear in other shell files that you, that you use, or definitely on the command line. And they're, when you have repetition, that tends to lead to errors. Um, and so a package can express its own defaults. And if you want to use those, you don't have to put them on the command line anymore. As long as they're in package JSON, they just work. And when we were doing our command line interface, we went to uh, great lengths to make the bundle and the start command work at exactly like the existing bundle and start commands that you use today. So you can just add rnx dash as a little prefix there. So instead of React Native bundle, you run React Native rnx bundle. And you'll get all the stuff I've been talking about for free. You can try it out. You'll get TypeScript errors. You'll get duplicate detection. You'll get all that stuff. So it's a lot of technology, but change like this doesn't really just happen with technology. People are at the core of this kind of work and this kind of change. And so we are going straight to the source. Like collaboration is absolutely key. We have a lot of industry partners we're working with. Um, a group I lead called the Bundle Working Group is a, folks from Meta, Callstack, Expo, Airbnb, Google, Klarna. We meet monthly and we talk about what's happening in the world of bundling and what changes should we be making and what's everybody working on and, and where do we want to spend our time. Um, these kind of collaborations really help change direction and, and align a bunch of people around single ideas. And that's really where, the, that's really where change really takes hold. Um, you know, we have meetings regularly with Meta about the platforms we're building, about the user experience challenges that we face, and most recently about developer experience, which is kind of what this talk is about. 
And so let me wrap up. Um, what did you learn today? This is the slide you're going to want to send to your boss or whoever you work for. It said, why did you send me to this conference? Well, this is what I learned. Microsoft loves React Native. We're heavily invested in this. And the challenges that I'm telling you about, the developer experience challenges, the technology challenges, the people challenges, it requires some change. And we are working towards an exceptional developer experience. That's our focus. Our next kit is our way to introduce tools that solve these problems. But really, collaboration is the key. Collaboration is how this change happens. And so in the spirit of collaboration, I'm inviting you to please try this stuff. Try the tools. Share your ideas. Leave feedback. Land code. Write your own tools. We'll submit them to the repo. You know, engage in the community in any way you can. And if you want, find me on Twitter. Let's talk. Uh, speaking of talks, we have another talk at RNEU here. Um, you can hear about how Microsoft is improving React Native and using it to power parts of Windows and Office to reach over a billion users. And this is sort of a broad view of React Native at Microsoft and, and how it lands in each of our different products. And so let me close with the theme of this talk, which is that a rising tide lifts all boats. Software really does have tremendous leverage. A, a few of us can impact many developers in a positive way. And positive change is just good for everyone. And it's, it is the way forward, the way that developers will accept change. And um, you know, the community responds well to things that help it and abandons things that don't. And we want to make sure we're in tune with what the community really needs. We want to lift all boats and head in that direction. So thank you so much for your time and attention. My name is Adam Foxman. You can reach me on Twitter at AFoxman4. My DMs are open, and I'm so looking forward to meeting you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Adam. Such an awesome talk. I love uh, developer experience, tools, this kind of subjects. I will definitely have some questions to you. Uh, but if you do have any questions to Adam, uh, Adam is prepared to answer on Discord, so just add him there. Uh, I will maybe post one of two of my questions there as well. So for the next topic, the next topic is how to access all of the Objective-C APIs using GSI. I don't know how to access all of the Objective-C APIs in Objective-C. Uh, from company Birchill, uh, it is Jamie Birch. How to access all the Objective-C APIs using JSI. I've come here in the middle of a typhoon to deliver this elaborate bridge metaphor, so I hope it was worth it. Enjoy the show. For the contents, first off, we'll be introducing myself, then we'll go into background of what we're trying to solve here, of native API access being annoying. We'll move on to how to use JSI because it's not documented at the moment. And then we'll get into the Objective-C runtime access. We'll start with a simple serializable API access and then move on to arbitrary non-serializable APIs. Finally, we'll just wrap up. Now, who's talking? I'm Jamie Birch. I work with all platforms. I work with the web at Birchill. I work on React Native when I'm making LinguaBrowse. And I'm on the NativeScript Technical Steering Committee, which exposes me to various ideas, different ideas about how to handle JS to native communication. Lastly, and above all, I'm an enemy of native code. So, background. Accessing native APIs is a pain. It's boilerplate city. It may involve installing, possibly forking an NPM module. It requires rebuilding, and that might be an Xcode rebuild, not a um, JS bundle rebuild your app and all of this is about breaking your workflow uh, switching your context and it's just painful so how could it be better 
What if you could call all native APIs directly from JS? Suppose you had a function call phone number. It takes in a phone number as a string, and from there it starts calling native APIs. We use nsurl, we call a class method on it, we look into UI application, uh, get a class property, call an instance method on it, and as our final party trick, you'll notice when we're passing that closure into, into the function, it's going to be automatically marshaled just like all the other uh, Objective-C objects from JavaScript into native, and I think that's just magical. Magical, yes, but it's not like it's never been done before. It's been done by NativeScript, Hyperloop, Dynamic Cocoa, JS Patch, and even Xamarin. Uh, although Xamarin is the same thing for C Sharp rather than JavaScript. Why should we care? The idea would be that if you can access all native APIs through JavaScript, maybe you never ever have to write, write a native module ever again. You never have to touch Xcode. You just need to know what SDKs are available. And other library developers can use this concept of direct native access through JS, and they can start making native libraries using JS, which is nice. It's ergonomic. It's what we're used to, why we came to React Native. So how would we go about this, though? We'll need something that's synchronous, fast, and supports native data types. Doesn't sound like the old classic JSON bridge. Sounds like a job for JSI. So let's set up an app that uses JSI, get everyone on the same page. It all starts the same way you make a regular app. Uh, we all start a standard React Native project from the TypeScript template. We'll open up the Xcode workspace and we'll run the target scheme. If this much the Hello World app failed to run, you will need to fix your environment. Now, we'll start making some files, put them alongside your app delegate, and uh, just give them these names, Objective-C Runtime, and uh, we'll fill them in in the following slides. Here's how you add the files to the Xcode project, incidentally. Now, let's set up our JSI module. The JSI module, the actual installation, you know, the bootstrapping can, if, you know, if, if maybe it's different for turbo modules, I don't really know the deal with those, but certainly the way I do it is you actually start a classic JSON bridge style module. So here we're importing RCT bridge module and we're extending that class. Nothing special going on here. Here's the implementation for it. It will all look pretty familiar if you've made a classic bridge module before. So we we implement this class, Objective-C Runtime. We export it with the same name, so that no params going into that macro. And we ask to be set up on the main queue because we may be accessing UI thread later on. We've got the installation lifecycle and the cleanup lifecycle. We'll be using those in a moment. So while we're here, we might as well get a reference to the bridge. So we'll just synthesize a set of the bridge named mbridge. That, that M stands for member, incidentally. And so during the installation lifecycle, we will just grab a reference to that bridge. And this allows us to clean up later in the invalidate lifecycle. Next up, we want to grab the JSI runtime. So we'll import the JSI headers and we'll start using the namespace Facebook. This might be the first bit of C++ that we're, we're seeing so far. And what this does is it shortens your imports from Facebook JSI runtime to just JSI runtime. So the next thing we do is we grab that bridge reference and we cast it to a RCT CXX bridge, which has a runtime property which we can grab. If that turns out to be null, um, we bail out and, um, yeah, we're kind of end of a row there. Now, what we're going to try doing here is set an object in the JavaScript context. So uh, forget the native side for a moment. Imagine you're writing some JavaScript and you write global.objc, or 
or can I just say Objective C? Now we'd like when you console log that for it to return a string, and that's what we're going to set up here. So the way we approach that, point number one in the comments, we will create a JSI string from a C string. So we've got this factory method from the JSI library, which goes JSI string create from ASCII. We pass in the runtime, and you'll see that star there means we're dereferencing the pointer to it. I don't know the details, that's just what it wants. And the second thing we're going to do is we're going to pass in a C string. Note how, unlike an objective C, there's no at symbol at the start of it. So it's a real C string, it's not an NS string. So we've created our JSI string, we've got it in hand, and we're just going to call this method here, which is runtime global set property. You notice that little arrow there after runtime? That's dereferencing runtime and grabbing a member variable from it or we're invoking it. Anyway, it's a thing. It's a thing on the instance. And again, we dereference a runtime pointer. We say obj c is the name of the thing we want to set, the property we want to set on the global object. And then we pass in that JSI string as a value. Lastly, don't forget cleanup. It's just good habits. Cleanup gets called, sorry, invalidate rather, gets called on full refresh for example. So we want to make sure that anything we did up until now gets cleaned away. We grab a reference to the JSI runtime as we did before. And we're, you know, the way we will approach this is we'll just do the opposite of when we set property object of C to a value. This time we'll make it, we'll ask for an undefined value because you can't actually delete, but you can override, overwrite rather. Um, if you had any native objects or anything here that you needed to clean up, now would be the time to do it. But um, so far we don't. Final part, we'll go into app.tsx and we'll try and call this thing that we've, uh, we've just set up. So point number one, we'll declare a constant, a constant named objective C. It's going to be any type. It's actually string type technically, but later on we will need it to be any. So let's just have it as any from now. Now, uh, point number two, we'll set up a use effect that will run upon mount and dismount, and we'll just log out Objective-C. Hopefully, at this point, you'll see in the console the text Objective-C, a C string. If not, you may have run into a startup race condition. Now, this is one of the infuriating parts of first getting involved JSI. If you've created a module just the way I have, there's a large chance that the first time you build, it won't have installed your JSI module by the time you use it, uh, even if you do a set timeout to wait. But I don't totally understand why, but there is a workaround. Here's where to find it. You go into Margulo's React Native Quick Crypto and you just search for RCT Export Blocking Synchronous Method. And what they've done is they've made a an approach where you install the module explicitly and block the runtime in order to do that. And this, yeah, this allows lazy loading. Whereas here we're relying on eager loading happening at the right time, which clearly it sometimes doesn't. Now that was a string, but JSI supports a lot more than strings. So how do we do that? Now, the way I'd like to pr present this is with a cheat sheet, which uh, you can take home for your own reference. So there's strings, there's numbers, there's booleans, and a lot more. Let's go into strings first. The JSI string, uh, oh, I should probably clarify for those who haven't seen any C++ before, JSI, I'm pretty sure that's a namespace. String, I think, is a class. Um, these colons just mean go down into the next... Uh, layer, you know, and then on that class, we're going to call a class method. Other languages call it a static method. I don't know what C++ actually wants us to say, but anyway. So we have this create from ASCII and create from UTF-8, and that's because it's expecting a C string to be passed in, but it wants you to tell it what encoding format you're imagining this string to be. So uh, the you know the easiest way to write it is a C string, like the, the least number of things to type. But some a lot of the time you'll be holding on to an NS string. So 
If you have an NS string, you can ask for the UTF-8 string property, which will give you a C string in UTF-8 representation. Now, we'll move on to numbers. You can uh, we have this JSI value class, which has an overloaded constructor, and based on what you pass in, it will figure out what you probably want. If you pass in a C number, it'll interpret it as a double, because all JSI numbers are doubles. Um, equally, you can pass in an NS number, but pull out the double value from it. And that's the longhand way of writing NS number. You could use the LLVM shorthand to write an NS number as well with the at symbol in front of the C number. Point to dereference it. And then finally, this looks a bit alien, but we're going to create a instance of a host object and wrap it as a shared wrap it with a shared pointer and yes it's alien and we'll come back to it later also make shared you know shared pointers might not be the only way to go about this but you know one way will do right uh, it's memory management in c++ is a big topic part three there's big ints i'm not going to say too much about them they've just been merged into master and they're not supported by the jsc runtime yet for example symbol uh, I think you can only clone them out of the JS context. I don't think you can create them afresh. Functions. Functions are the lifeblood of JSI. It gives you so much power. A uh, little bit complicated, very scary if you're just coming into C++. So what we're looking at here is a host function followed by a, the actual creation of JSI function. So let's zoom in on the host function first. That word auto there means please and further type for me. Uh, we're, we're going to be making a function that sums two numbers together. That opening sort of, uh, square bracket thing, that's the dependency list of things you want to pull into this closure. And in this case, we've got no dependency we want to pull in, so we'll leave that empty. We t this closure accepts four arguments. It has a runtime. It has the this value in case you want to access this outside the closure, or inside the closure rather, uh, and then it's got the start of the arguments list and the number of arguments present in that list. And you'll see the arguments are each just a JSI value, but you need to, for each one, express which, which type you want it to be expressed as. And depending on whether you call get number or as number, you can implicitly get a, uh, a a checking of the type, an assertion, as you're about to do that. And so now we've made our host function, and we just need to make the JSI function. You'll see JSI function created from host function, pass in and dereference the, uh, the runtime pointer, create a pr provide a prop name for it, which is pretty simple. Uh, we're going to call our function sum on the JavaScript side. So we say sum, please. We tell it it's got two arguments and we give it the host function. So now you know all the kind of types we can make, the primitive types in JSI. Uh, it would be handy to not have to write all the boilerplate for it to each time. And so what I found very helpful is this JSI utils file that Mark Rusevi makes use of in his React Native Vision Camera library. I believe it was originally extracted from RCT Turbo module. Um, so maybe one day it will actually become something you can import straight out of React Native core. And it provides a bunch of functions like convert NS string to JSI string and convert JSI string to NS string, which saves you a lot of reinventing the wheel on, on your side. So, now you're fluent in JSI, let's start building our Objective-C runtime projection. We're going to get into lots of Objective-C metaprogramming, and the point is maybe less for you to be able to walk away from this writing your own Objective-C runtime, but more just knowing what the possibilities are and seeing a few ways uh, that we can make use of JSI. So let's set out the objectives, what we're aiming for right now. We'll, we're going to create a host object via JSI that can be accessed globally from JS as object C. So if you write global.objc, uh, 
it on in the in your JS code, it will give you a host object on the JS side. That host object will, um, you know, before we populated it, it's just going to look like a regular JavaScript object. But after we've actually filled it all in, it will provide an experience similar to writing Objective C. You'll be able to access constants, classes, method calls, and when you pass JavaScript. Uh, data types into it, whether it's a JavaScript string or actually another host object you had from some other function call, you can it will be marshaled as it's coming through to the native side and will, you know, it'll unwrap relevant parts of it and say, oh, I see there's a string under there, I know what to do with that, for example. And for this talk, we'll implement getters. I'm afraid I don't have time to cover setters uh, but you know it's really much the same thing just you're uh, you're calling different objective C meta programming uh, functions so yeah we'll, we'll we'll just do getters for now so first off uh, our global object C value is returning a string let's make it return a subclass of JSI host object instead so to start off on this, let's make a couple of files, host object, object C, and they'll be empty for now. Add them to a project. And here's where we start really seeing some JSI. Here's the interface. We're going to import JSI headers, and we're going to use namespace Facebook to shorten our imports. We've got a class with a macro, I think that might be, I don't really know, uh, JSI export. Our class named host object, object of C, is extending a JSI host object. And so it's going to override a couple of host objects APIs. It's got the get API and the get property names. And on the next slide, I'll explain what they actually do. So this was the interface. Let's move into the implementation. Here's, we're just going to start with a stub. So of course, import that header we just wrote, and then let's just, just describe what the get uh, method does. Now that's going to return the value for any given property accessed. So at its simplest level, you might do, um, so here's my variable global.obc. Maybe I do global.obc.toString, and then the word toString will come in as a prop name, and we've got to decide what to do with that. But not just two string. Uh, maybe they're asking for um, UI view, and we've got to grab a UI view. So all sorts of things. And yeah, for now we'll just return undefined. And then the other the other API is get property names, and this defines the list of enumerable keys. So if you if you call an object or keys on this host object it's going to tell you, uh, well, it's going to list out everything that we've specified here. So we'll probably want to list out things like ns string to know you can call global.obc.ns string and get, get a, a wrapped up ns string on the JavaScript side. But for now, we'll return an empty array. This will look a bit alien as well. A std vector is, you know, in, in my head, it's a mutable array. And it's a mutable array of, of you know prop names. So we're just going to return that while it's empty. Next up, we are going to go back to that object C runtime file and we're going to expose host object object C. Uh, so remember our set property call. We don't need that JSI string anymore, but we, what we are going to do is we're going to instantiate a host object object C and we're going to wrap it in a shared pointer. Finally, we go to app.tsx and we try logging it out. So, first up, if you try logging it as is, uh, you'll just get an empty object uh, visually. If you try listing out the keys, you'll get an empty array. And if you try calling to string, you'll see something possibly surprising. I'd expected to string to be implemented, but it uh, turns out you don't get that for free. So, um, in in the repo for this project, which I'll be providing a link to by the end, uh, we do actually implement to string tag, which gives you to string as a result, but uh, we're not going to go into it in this talk because there's no time. Uh, 
All right, but let's start easy, exposing a known serializable API from Objective-C. Here's our target. We have this API declaration, NS string transform. Uh, sorry, it's an NS string transform Latin to Hiragana, and it's of type NS string transform, which is really just an NS string by another name. This is a global variable, is what I want to say. And we want to make it available on the JS side when you access Objective-C. <laughs> I can't pronounce Object-C very easily. Objective-C dot NS string transform Latin to Hiragana. We want it to return the string value of that variable because it's you know it is an NS string. It has an inherent string value. We'll like to see what that is. So how do we go about that? Go into host object object C. Um, we are going to add a little to the getter. Don't forget to import foundation because we're just about to call something from the foundation library. If the user calls object C dot in a string transform Latin to Hiragana, that name will come through and we can have a case for that. And in such case, we'll return a JSI string based on the UTF string value, uh, which is a C string, um, for that variable that we pull out of global scope. And this is this is a really cool thing about Objective C. You can seamlessly do Objective C stuff in the middle of a C context. It's crazy stuff. And uh, to illustrate, we will update the enumerable keys, and it's as simple as saying there's a new enumerable key called NS string transform Latin to Hiragana. Let's look at the result on the TypeScript side. We'll try accessing it, and you'll see what it logs out. The that first line when we're logging out Objective C as is, you'll notice that it gives for each key. I think uh, potentially each enumerable key that we specified on the object, it does a get on that. So do be careful if you've got any sort of expensive things to call get on, because the yeah the standard logging will show it off. And you'll see the value for uh, NS string transform Latin de Hiragana is close bracket KCF string transform Latin Hiragana. And if you object keys, you will see the list of keys. So congratulations, you just proxied a native API. Um, now there's a lot more you can do from here. Let's go the whole way exposing arbitrary Objective-C APIs, even non-serializable ones. Now we could sort of do an individual, we could just focus on NS string and call it a day, but that's a bit boring. So I kind of thought with the time remaining, how about we go the whole hog? Um, no matter what class they ask for, we'll, we'll have a solution for that, we'll have a way to wrap it. And once they've got a class, how about we let them make instances of that class and call methods on it? Maybe we've got enough time, but we'll, we'll see how rushed this gets. So, um, how do we approach this? We'll approach it by improving our host object C class we already made. It will handle any value in object C runtime. Now, for that, the constructor will now need to take a pointer to a native object, allowing us to wrap any native data type, and a is global param just for the special case of the global object. That get method we implemented before will now proxy through to the underlying native object, and the get property names will now list all the available properties. We'll skip set as there's not much time. So, um, a few changes here. Point number one, we've introduced this new enum, which expresses the various different types of native reference we support. We have other, just a catch-all, yeah, we don't really do anything special for this, but we have classes, class instances, and then the global. And you'll see that now means our constructor has a native ref as a param, we're using void star, kind of catch-all, and then bool as a param to say, is it the global or not? We then got a member variable uh, that's native ref, and then we've got a, a member variable for the type, so that once we've figured out the type at construction time, we don't have to keep rechecking it during our implementation. And then no changes to the methods implemented. Part two, we will just outline what the implementation is going to be like. So in our constructor, 
and we are going to determine the type of native ref and initialize the M type. Uh, point number two, if the M type turns out to be global, we're going to look up all class, uh, the classes, protocols, or variables matching that name. Otherwise, if the M type turns out to be class or class instance, we will look up methods or properties. And if we get a match for none of those, we'll just return undefined. For get property names, we will also return the name for every case that we handle in the get method above. You'll recall that we instantiated an instance of host object C when uh, we set it on the object C global. Um, the, we just need to update the constructor, so it now takes null. Well, you could really pass anything in here for the, the case of global, we just need to pass something in. And uh, we said true, because yes, this is the one time where we're making one of these and it is the global. Now here is how we're going to implement the constructor. So first off, if if the person on the outside told us it's the global, then easy peasy, we say the M type is global. And for the next things, we're going to need the it to import some Objective-C runtime helper functions. So we'll do a try catch. And the interesting thing about try catch uh, with this at symbol in front of it is it handles both Objective-C and C++ exceptions as long as it's a 64-bit app. Don't ask me why, but that's what Apple said. Um, first, we're going to find out: does it, you know, is it an NS object of some sort? And the way we do that is we try firing an is kind of class message at it, which will throw an error if it's not an NS object in the first place, in which case we fall through and we set the type to other. But if it does respond, uh, we will do a bit more metaprogramming. We'll say, okay, get me the class of that thing. And if that class turns out to be an Objective-C meta class, then we know the only way that could have happened is if that, th that thing we were holding was a class rather than a class instance. Because if you ask for class of a class instance, it will give you the class. But if you ask for the class of a class, it will give you the meta class. You'll notice also we're doing that uh, cast to bridge NS object. So the, the native ref came in as a void, a void pointer. We have to say, so if we're going to call an NS object method on it, we need to say, well, you're an NS object is the going assumption. And because we're doing this in a, I think the reason was we're in a C++ context, we need to say, we need to either change the pointer ownership or anyway, what I've gone with here is I say bridge, please. Um, and it means no change in ownership of the pointer. And I don't know, it's it's just what the, uh, what the compiler suggested as the auto fix and I've gone, I've rolled with that. Next up, now we're inside the get method and we're gonna implement class and protocol getters. So uh, this will be for the, the case where we do objects, object C dot NS string. So we're a global right now. So point number one, if it turns out, yes, we're global. Uh, first thing we're gonna do is use the objective C runtime helper NS class from string whereby we pass in a string uh, saying, here's the name of our class, for example, UI view. And if it does return a class, then we know, bingo, um, we, our work here is done, we can wrap it up in a host object, obc, and return that. If we get no hit for that, then maybe it's a protocol. So we'll try NS protocol from the string and wrap that up and return that. If not, we'll continue on to the next slide. I've just got no space to show all the lines for that block in this one slide. If it's neither a class or a protocol, we'll see if maybe it's a global variable. And for global variables, um, we've got to dip into uh, the dynamic linker. So we import that up there. We use DL sim. I uh, really don't think about this too much. Um, we use DL sim, look up the name of the symbol, and if we get a hit, we will wrap it up, dereference a pointer as necessary, and uh, create a host object from it. If not, we return undefined. Now, suppose we're not the global, we're of other type. We're just gonna return undefined for the getter. And 
if we're a class instance or a class, we will create an NS selector using that that string name and we'll call invoke method. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to implement that in this presentation. I'd say check out the repo. It's quite a long method, but and uses a lot of Objective-C metaprogramming. Now, if if we got no hit for that selector, if there's no method by that name, I will just continue the block on the next slide. Um, and maybe it's not a method, but it's a property. So let's handle that. Classes and class instances have subtly different ways to get the properties. You either do it using, either way you need the class itself. And then you call class get property. Pass in the name, if you get a hit for that, uh, we go a bit further and we grab the value for that property and we marshal it into a JSI object. And that's using one of the helper methods from JSI utils, convert object to C object to JSI value. And if none of those things worked, our default case is to return undefined. Get property names. I'll just breeze over this bunch of object to C metaprogramming. Um, we will copy the prop. You know what? I don't have time to go over this, uh, but there you go. You can look at that later. Now, there are some other things I don't really have time to go into, like, as mentioned, uh, setters and the invoke method implementation. And for both of these, I say just check out the shidakaba slash rnobjectc repo. Finally, we'll get into app.tsx and we will invoke it. Um, well, in, we, we will try to use all the features at once. So we will ask for an NS string class We'll allocate an instance of it, and with that instance, we will call a instance method, which is an, another initializer. We say, uh, here's a JavaScript string saying shirakawa, and we want to call a method on the NS string we get from, back from that, which is to transform that Japanese phrase into Latin. Uh, that's a transliteration, it doesn't actually like translate. And when you finally log that out, uh, you'll see the result is it's translated shirakaba into, well, shirakaba, but Roman letters. And after all that, congratulations, you can now arbitrarily access the Objective-C runtime from JS. It handled all that marshalling and holding onto objects, and it was just great. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> or did they? So here's a confession. I have had a lot of problems implementing this. It's a bit inconsistent. It's not totally working. I get a lot of cases of bad memory accesses, and I suspect it's something to do with strong and weak refs. I think I need a strong ref, and I'm just doing things wrong, and it's I keep ending up pointed at bad memory. So it's only on a good run when all this works, but it works in theory. So this is sort of something I'd really love some code review on by someone who's much better at C++. The whole reason I'm creating this is because I am a JavaScript guy, enemy of native code. Um, and so obviously I have some weak spots on the C++ side. So that was one of my worries, memory management. Are we losing our native refs? Are we leaking memory? Is it secure? Because as you just saw, we got into um, some memory we weren't allowed to access. Further work's needed for marshalling C values, uh, because right now we only handle things that extend NS objects, and TypeScript typings, we're, we've got just got any type at the moment. Debugging is hard as everything's dynamic, and you know there's always the unanswerable question, will Apple reject apps using this library? I don't really have uh, a answer for that, but we've got some future ideas. Maybe someone can come along and say, oh, I know exactly what's going wrong with the memory accesses. Here's some help. Um, we could change from dynamic access to static access. So take, use, for example, um, native script or Xamarin's approach to finding out the, the names of all the classes that exist in the runtime and not just classes, class uh, methods and everything. And we can make a dedicated file describing here is an S string and everything you can want to do with it, rather than relying on things like the dynamic linker and Objective-C runtime helpers. 
I'd like this to be used as an approach for smaller scale libraries, as, as I said, just maybe just tackle NSString on its own. Uh, it would be cool to have an Android equivalent of this. And you know, other options are, if I can't get the memory right in JSI, maybe just delegate to NativeScript. We could use JSI to call NativeScript from React Native, or even better, swap React Native JSC uh, or V8 for NativeScript JSC or V8 and call it directly. So, in conclusion, JSI and Adjective C++, not so scary for simple tasks. JSI is suitable for arbitrary native API access if we get it right. I hope you learned a bit more about C++, Objective-C metaprogramming, and building JSI modules in general. So, thank you very much for attending. Uh, my name's Jamie Birch, and uh, that's all from me. Not so scary, huh? A lot of code there. Uh, if you have any questions to Jamie, he said he's uh, around for Q&A on Discord, so I direct your questions there. I already did mine. Uh, that was our final talk from the first segment, so let's recap. We had three talks today uh, in the first segment. We had Nicola, we had Adam, and now Jamie. Uh, right now, what I would like you to do is to get a coffee. <laughs> that was dense. Uh, and we will meet here in 15 minutes. Uh, there will be a timer for the live stream so you know when we'll be back. And yeah, see you in 15. This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts.
Hi. Hello again. I hope all, all of you made it. I hope all of you had coffee. Uh, I hope you are rested. So I have a confession to make. First three speakers had really easy names to pronounce, like Adam. <laughs> the next one, um, I, I, I will do my best. I will do my best uh, for the duration of this conference to pronounce the names as they should be, but uh, I don't promise anything. So the next talk is how we made our app 80% faster, a uh, data structure story. And from Verdi, it is Marine Godoshaw. How did I do? Hi everyone, I'm Marin, I'm a software engineer at Birdie, and today I'm going to tell you the story of how we made our app 80% faster. It's a data structure story, but it's more than that. It's a happy story of massive performance improvements, but it's also a cautionary tale of lacking performance monitoring and also a whole bunch of other mistakes we've made. Uh, this is all about many mistakes we've made, what we learned from it, and how we had this massive improvement in the end. I hope this story will be entertaining and that you'll learn something from it. As all good stories, it's in three chapters. And because I know that's the main thing you're waiting for, the one thing that's improved our performance by 80% is in the third chapter. So let's move on to the first one and start from the beginning. So first, how did we get here? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Birdie, what we do and all that, just do, so that you have enough context to understand really the pain points uh, we run into. So first, what is Birdie? Birdie is a company trying to make our world a world in which we all age vibrantly and with confidence. Uh, so in whatever way we can, we try to improve the lives of older adults in their own home. The way that works currently is we provide software to home care agencies so that they can visit older adults in their own homes and take care of them. Uh, what that looks like is a web app that you can see on the right uh, that is used by care managers and agencies to plan visits, medications, tasks, all sorts of things that needs to be delivered during these visits. And here we can see a uh, snippets of the mobile app that is used by carers when they go to the client's home and deliver the visit. So let's briefly go over what the UX looks like, uh, the user flow for a carer going to a visit. First, they will see all the visits they have planned for that day. They will select one, go to a client home, do a geolocation check-in. Then they will see all the tasks and medications they need to deliver during this visit. For medications, we have some more forms with multiple uh, stages in there so that they can record multiple types of observations and those sort of things. Then they can see when everything is done. They can also record some extra um, uh, observations for other medications that day. Uh, they can check information about past medications for that person that day that's useful when for example, you want to check that the last time a medication was given, it wasn't like too close to now that you're trying to administer it. All of these safety features that are very important because this app is really critical. Uh, if you overdose or if you miss a dose, you can, it can really have dramatic consequences. And finally, uh, they can record all sorts of observations about what happened during the, the visit, what they observed about uh, the older adult the client they're taking care of. All of this flow, it has lots of data, and all of it needs to be on the device because it's all offline first. Because, well, they sometimes have to visit clients in the countryside with very low signal area, and we want to make sure that all of 
those critical features work offline. Another interesting point, this talk is about performance, and for many performance talks, um, it's usually about keeping your users engaged, keeping them on your app as much as possible by having a great user experience. Well, this time, it's the other way around. For us, good performance means that they take less time spent on the app, and they can take the time to really take care of their clients in their homes. So we want to get out of the way of what they're doing. Now, this great mobile app, it was Birdie's first product. It's a bit more than four years old now, actually. So it's all based on mostly four years old React Native stuff. And after all this time, and after building lots and lots of features on top of it, we end up in a situation with, well, pretty bad performance, as you'll see more of it later, uh, which is due to many things, but uh, one of the reasons we got there was because our engineers, were, they work on their own devices, which are mostly powerful devices, uh, or on emulators, which doesn't represent uh, accurately real-life performance on real devices. We also had barely any tooling for uh, monitoring our performance, and we have very indirect feedback for performance issues, because the carers are using the app, and so for us to know about a really bad performance issue, it means that the carer has to be frustrated enough to complain to their managers who are paying for Birdie, who will then complain to us, and that's when we start looking into things. Um, and then after four years and many uh, teams working on many features, we had a massive, very complex code base, and as I said, it's very critical, so we have to make sure we don't break anything every time we make changes. So quick recap of chapter one. We have a four-year-old care delivery React Native app. It's slow, and we don't know why. That's the stage for our story. Now, let's all embark on this magnificent journey, chapter two, a journey into the unknown. So we have this slow app. We don't know why. Our first assumptions was, well, for four years, we've been building lots of features without really looking into performance that much. So maybe it's just thousands of performance paper cuts, lots of little things we just didn't take care of. And so when we're not experts in React Native and we have this problem, we turn to the best expert we know, the Internet hive mind. So we looked on Google for React Native performance tips. We tried many things. Um, among those things, we reduced all the useless re-renders we had everywhere in our app. We didn't have proper lists, so we moved to virtualized flask lists to have better performance there as well. Uh, as we saw from medications, for example, we have forms with multiple stages, so we started freezing our navigation stack to avoid lots of re-renders in the background, um, and many more things like upgrading dependencies and a whole bunch of stuff, hoping for the best. Now, after all that, after months of improvement, it was a little better, but still bad. Now, you might be wondering, how much better? How bad? Well, who knows? <laughs> we don't have any tooling, so all we could do was try and get out ourselves and see if it was better. Uh, it was really hard to quantify the difference it made. Now, after that, um, after a bit more manual testing and a lot more experimentation, it was really clear that it was a scalability issue. Now, what do I mean by scalability? It means that um, each of the care agencies have their own uh, environment and a big agency made the app slower, which means that we seem to have a link between the number of clients in an agency and how bad the performance was. So once we got there, we looked at what are all the things, all the data we're handling that is scaling up with the number of clients. So we had the client infos, like their profile pictures, their name, all that. We had uh, user permissions. Those are permissions we use to control features that are enabled or not for an agency or for a specific client. Um, 
visit reports because whenever you deliver a visit, you create a visit report and you can see previous visit reports to see what was done before uh, with this client. And finally, the client tasks. So all the things that you need to deliver um, during a visit. Actually, we download all the tasks and medications for that day for all the clients you are assigned to because sometimes uh, you just need to go and deliver an unscheduled visit, we call that, and so you need to be ready to be able to deliver those um, even if you're offline. So that's actually a lot of data, and we figured that in the biggest agencies that was tens of megabytes of data that kept moving around and kept being handled in our mobile app. So we focused on that. And by doing a little bit more experimenting, uh, we made a new assumption, which, which was that maybe we just had too much data going through the bridge. Now, let me explain a bit more. Quick recap of the bridge. We have the JavaScript side of things. We have the native side of things. Linked by the bridge with JSON. That's about it. That's all you need to understand for, from this section. We use Redux in our app to manage all of this data that I just talked about. And for our app to keep working fine if the app crashes or whatever and you need to keep all that data, we use Redux Persist. Uh, Redux Persist, the way it works briefly is whenever you have a new action going through your Redux state, updating your re uh, Redux state, it will persist it on the device um, so that then when you open the app again, uh, however it was closed, you can get back this data without having to refetch it. And in our case, we had an issue because, as I said, we have many, many tasks. And whenever you just try to complete one, well, you're actually updating the entire task state, and all of that has to be updated and persisted, which means in our case, uh, Redux persists. Uh, it has to turn everything into a string to get uh, stored on the device, which means that on almost every action-related task, we had to stringify a massive array of tasks, and yeah, that was expensive, pretty bad. We could see a, a big stringify thing on our uh, graphs when we looked it through React Native Debugger and do sort of profiling tools. So we were sure this was the issue. And so we looked at multiple solutions, and one that looked pretty good to us, and we focused on, was a tool called WatermelonDB. So if you haven't heard of it before, it's um, a cool tool that's based on an SQLite database that is on the device. And then it uses a pattern called observables to update your components based on changes on that database. So we would basically replace Redux and Redux Persist by this SQLite database that is on the device. Which means that now we're not stringifying an entire task full of, uh, state full of tasks. We're only stringifying the query we're doing to update our task. Which means that um, whatever amount of tasks you have stored on your device, it's still the same amount of data that needs to be stored and exchanged. Now, sounds like the perfect solution. How did it go? Well, first, it was actually a lot of work to get it working um, because it wasn't a greenfield project, uh, almost the opposite of a greenfield project. Uh, so trying to get both watermelon DB and Redux to work together meant that we had to create this new concept of observable selectors, which meant that on the same component you could use the two and have your UI update at the same time. Um, actually, if that interests anyone, if that could be useful to anyone, we'll be very happy to work together to make it open source and useful to anyone. Feel free to reach out. Uh, once that was done, Turns out that all those observables patterns didn't really work with a um, lot of our legacy code, which meant that we had lots of bugs. So, yeah, that was not a great solution. Oh, and worst of all, it was still slow. Yeah. And why was it slow? 
<laughs> we still don't know. No idea, because we still didn't have tooling. That's when we learned our lesson and introduced performance monitoring. Um, we went with Datadog REM for this, which is a real user monitoring tool. Um, it was first uh, for the web, but now it works with React Native as well. Uh, and so we introduced this, and that way we were sure we were able to measure the changes we've made to performance things in our app. Now, when we saw all that, our next assumption was that maybe this strategy of downloading all this data, all those tasks, maybe that was just too much data. So we went with a UI exchange rather than an underlying technological change. And we looked into introducing a manual download of tasks rather than downloading everything by default. And that looked pretty much like um, your video or music streaming app with a button on the right that allows you to download the task for the client you want. And that way, if you don't have a specific planned visit for that client, but you know you might visit them later and you will be offline, you can choose to download it. And that way, um, the amount of tasks stored on your device wasn't linked to the amount of clients assigned to you on an agency, which meant that this would become scalable again. We introduced this change on uh, some test agencies that we had with many, many clients. And this time, we were able to measure it. So, what was the result? It was still slow. So all of this took months, each iterations. Um, and now that we're here, let's just have a quick recap of this chapter two. We tried many React Native performance tips. We tried a more scalable data management. And we tried just reducing the amount of data of tasks. And it's still slow. So what, what is the issue? Why is it slow? Well, it's time now for chapter three, the big reveal. <laughs> uh, let's go back to all the data that scales with the amount of clients we have. So we now know that it's not the client tasks, because it doesn't make a difference uh, in performance. Now, what else do we have? Visit reports. Well, uh, from what we've seen on our test agencies, some of them have many clients and almost no visit reports, and some have the other way around. And they, there doesn't seem to be a correlation there. So it doesn't seem to be visit reports. Client infos, well, we're not manipulating that a lot, and it's barely any data. It really doesn't seem like a good candidate. That leaves us with user permissions. Hmm, what about user permissions? Let's maybe look a bit closer at what those user permissions look like. Turns out they're pretty bad. Oh, oh, sorry, that's, that's ugly. Yeah that's, yeah, that's as bad as it looks. It's a massive array of strings, just no structure, just that's it, an array of strings. And that was introduced when we launched the app about four years ago. And we had 15 permissions per user approximately at the time. Turns out that four years later, we have more than 10,000 per users. Um, so yeah, that's why this is bad. Uh, especially because those permissions are in our Redux selectors, in many, many of our components, pages, all of that, because every time we load a page, we see how should it be displayed, what should be displayed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now let's take a closer look at how those permissions are structured. As we can see, there's um, two types of permissions: agency levels one and client level ones, uh, where it's just agency and the permission, like here, managing caregivers, or for a specific client, uh, CR means care recipient. So we know it's for a care recipient. We have the client ID and then the permission, like in this case, downloading a PDF of their info. Well, looks like we can change the structure. And we did a very simple change. We just turned this array into an object, where now, when you're looking for the permission for a client, it's not. O N anymore with N being 
up to 10,000 permissions. It's just O1 to find your clients because you know already which key you're looking for. And then you're just looking through an array of up to 10 permissions. Um, uh, I can hear the irony of us in the past assuming that 10 permissions was fine, so it's not the perfect solution. Uh, but still, we introduced that, and let's see what impact it had. So with a quick before and after of switching agency, which actually resets everything in our app. So here, the after is already done after like four seconds, and the before takes 40 seconds. And that's on uh, our biggest test agency that we use to test those types of scalability issues. Uh, I don't know if we're going to wait for that one, actually. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Now, how do we know, other than by looking at it, that it was improved by 80%? Well, thanks to our cool new tool of Datadog REM. Um, Datadog REM has um, some mobile vitals that can be used to assess performance of uh, your app. For example, frames per second, uh, CPU usage, memory usage, frozen frames, all those things. And so here we had two sessions that were recorded, as you saw, and it was clear that one of them was really bad and the other was fine. And when looking at those vitals, there were no difference. So, yeah, that was a bit frustrating as well. Um, so what we did is we added some more custom tooling. We started instrumenting Redux itself uh, by adding all of our Redux selectors, reducers, uh, Redux sagas as well uh, in our monitoring of Datadog, which meant that we had cool graphs like this where on a single page we could see what the user did, but also what happened in the background, which selectors were used, how long did they took to get data, uh, same for updating the state with reducers or getting sagas to run, et cetera, et cetera. And what did we find with this? Well, here we looked at the average duration of Redux processes after our permission update, and as you can see, it was massive, up to 92% decrease for selectors, 90% for reducers, 64% for sagas. Here, we finally found it, our bottleneck. We also looked at uh, specific devices. Um, here at the top, we have a low-end Alcatel, then a mid-range Nokia, and a high-end Samsung. And as we can see, the biggest impact was on low-end devices. Uh, but still a very noticeable impact on high-end devices. And that's it, a happy ending. Finally, we fix our performance issues. But I actually don't think that's the most important thing. The most important thing is what can we learn from all of this, from this story? Well, let's wonder, why did it take us so long to find the issue? Well, the first mistake we made multiple times was that we mistook other issues as the main performance bottleneck. We, find, we found a performance issue and we assumed that was the issue, so we just jumped straight at it and tried to fix that before trying to compare what was going to have the biggest impact. In particular, well, we were blinded by what I called the big stringify, uh, which was an issue, but maybe, well, in this case, not the biggest one. In general, we were blinded by tasks just because it was the biggest part of our state. And yeah, we, we just jumped straight at it without looking at a bigger picture. So what are the learnings from it? Well, first, you need to validate your assumptions before investing in solutions, especially if they're expensive, take time, etc. Then performance improvements without tooling is a guessing game, and it's a game that you're not likely to win. So invert, <laughs> invest in, uh, in tooling and monitoring, it will make your life a lot easier. Now, a classic, 
the one we learn about the first time we read the Redux documentation. So Redux selectors are bad. It, they have a really big impact on user experience, as you, you are able to see. And finally, a classic, just in general, when we tend to just look at um, high-level high uh, programming concepts, just data structures and complexity matters. It's especially when you scale, uh, it has a massive impact. And that's it. That's the end of our journey, of our learnings. I hope it was entertaining. I hope you learned something. Um, you can contact me on Twitter, LinkedIn, mail. Everything is on my call .co. I'm a software engineer at Birdie. Now we know what we do. You know what we do. Um, we're still learning, still growing, hiring. And uh, yeah, feel free to contact us if you want to work with us. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Amazing talk. I learned a lot. Uh, performance is definitely a big subject. We want our apps to be performant, to be fast, and to not load for 40 seconds. Um, yeah. And for the next topics, also about performance, um, the topic name is you can go everywhere, but I can go fast. Holistic case study on performance from call stack, Jakub Binda. Hello everyone, I would like to share with you my thoughts regarding the title of my talk, which is you can go everywhere, but I can go fast. I found this analogy that the apps are like cars. They are designed for specific purpose, and if you ever face a car choice, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, the type, type of vehicle is picked depending on your needs. And because I need a decent amount of space inside my car, because I have a wife and two children, I usually end up with a car on the right, an off-road car. It's cool because it has a many features included, it gives me a lot of flexibility, and actually I can go everywhere I want. On the other hand, I also love speed and always dreamed about having a hypercar. So I start to think what could happen if I put an engine from a hypercar to the car that I use on a daily basis. So let's consider that case for a moment. The first thing I would probably do uh, would be to take that car to the straight line to set up a new speed record. And I would probably feel a big difference in acceleration, making a big wow each time accelerate. But when emotions go down, uh, I probably will realize that there's still someone faster than me. Furthermore, changing rules of the game by competing on the racetrack with turns doesn't improve the result that things might get even worse. And to check why, we need to take a closer look on how hypercars look like, because they have a white body, streamlined, white streamlined body, a big wheels and brakes, and load center of gravity. Uh, there are also some um, design uh, aspect behind the hood that people who designed hypercar need to think about carefully and uh, before even can car, hypercar uh, was produced. Because I said that the mobile applications are like cars, let's answer a question. What can we do if our application is more like an off-road car, has a lot of features, but not particularly good in performance in regard of speed. My name is Jakub Binda. I'm a software developer at Callstack, passionate in improving app performance. And let me guide you to the list of possible modification with the context of React Native application to close our hypothetical application as much as possible 
to the hypercar and see where the dog's divagation takes us. Uh, the first possible modification that I would probably start with is a rate reduction. In the world of automotive, uh, we basically want to remove all of unnecessary uh, parts from interior as well as from exterior. Or if it's not possible, we need to find a lighter uh, replacement. <coughs> In terms of uh, React application, we actually can do the same because we are able to uh, do uh, size reduction of the bundle by removing that or legacy code, avoid uh, bundling heavy JSON files. Exam the example is the JSON files with the translation because they can be handled in different way and also keep our node modules clean by removing third party libraries that is not used or seek for um, its lighter equivalent. In one of my previous assignment, I was able to provide a benchmark and compare the script downland exec and execution time uh, in the baseline project uh, in comparison with the blank React Native project. Uh, as you can see in the table, the difference is quite huge because it equals 2.3 seconds and it's pretty obvious because we want in our application to put a feature to the end user and because of that feature we need to uh, attach additional code additional logic however this number uh, can also tell us that there is a room for uh, improvement and optimization and actually that was the case in this project uh, because I was able to reduce the bundle size from 28 megabytes uh, up to around uh, 15. And it has an impact on script download time, which improved by 26%, as well as script execution, which improves, improves by 10. And the final TTI uh, improved by around 13%. Another important aspect on car design are how the power from the engine are transferred to the wheels. Mm, in this chain, we have uh, uh, different components that is quite sophisticated. And because of that, there um, are some power loses in that chain. Uh, so it's not possible to have 100% of power uh, from the engine on car wheels. In the same way, uh, in React application, we have the components that should be presented to the user. And to achieve that, uh, we need to consume some of the resources from our device. Uh, that's why the components should be as light as possible and render only a required number of times to prevent too much uh, resources, uh, <coughs> too much uh, resources lost. And one kind of component that uh, I found to be very problematic are the shimmers. The shimmers looks, uh, for example, like that. And its purpose is to improve UX by making an impression that content in the application uh, appears faster than it actually does. Four of my previous projects that I had the chance to investigate, however, shows me that the reality related with the shimmers are uh, slightly different uh, because the implementation, the shimmer were complex and heavy, and also the implementation seems to be over engineered. Mm, I start to uh, profiling the application with the flipper plugin, uh, with the flipper profiling tool, and in result achieved the flame chart for that shimmer. And as you can see, that's how the flame chart for that shimmer looks. And uh, I was able to uh, notice that the render time 
for that particular component equals 132 uh, milliseconds. And this is the value that is very close uh, to the value that human eye can actually notice. So uh, there might be some flickering occurs during uh, rendering the shimmer. Mm. The ugly underlying reason was connected with using one of the existing library to create shimmers. And because in that particular use, most of the logic delivered by, di by that library uh, wasn't even used, uh, then the component becomes too heavy to its use case. Mm, the solution was to provide a lighter version of primitives for, for the shimmers and avoid need to execute uh, additional logic. Uh, the final score of render time equals 36 milliseconds, which is four times better result than before. And also the structure of that uh, shimmer uh, were uh, simplified. Mm, using a flame chart and profiling tool from Flipper, it's a very nice tool that you can use not only for the shimmers, but actually for uh, whatever component in your application that you want. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about the airflow over the car. Streamlight body allows you to uh, allows to reduce the turbulences behind the car. Uh, however, in case of our off-road car, they might become a serious issue and stop us down from reaching the top speed. Uh, I like to think about those uh, turbulences as a unexpected render in a React Native application. And if we are talking about the renders, I need to mention about the component structure because the, st the structure defines the correlation between components and also a sequence of rendering. When the component structure becomes complex and too complex, actually, mm, it might lead to longer render time and more resources consumption from our device, as well uh, as more re-renders. So uh, I again utilize the profiling tool from Flipper and during one of the investigation noticed something like that. Uh, I used to call this pattern as long tails when some part of the component structure are much longer than uh, the neighborhood of that <laughs> structure. And in this case, uh, there were uh, 38 components and also much of them has its internal state, which actually mm, caused the additional render. Mm. I was able to move out that internal component state uh, to higher component, but also mm, I was able to reduce total amount of the component. And uh, the final result was that uh, compo the, the components in the same uh, structure uh, were reduced to 20 and this is how the final structure looks like after the modification uh, I mentioned and also I were able to prevent free unexpected render in the current case. Uh, so again, uh, flame chart and uh, flipper profiling uh, was extremely useful to provide and uh, allow to spot that weak point in the application. Another important aspect in car design are the tires. The tires are the only part in your car that actually have contact with the road. So um, that's why uh, I like to think about React hooks about like the tires in your car because they allow to communicate component with the rest of the application uh, by, for example, uh, you triggering the side effects. And despite the fact that they were, the support of them in React Native were introduced in March 2019, I still feel that implementation of some of the hooks 
are problematic in terms of performance because improper use might lead to unexpected re-render uh, when their value change and also when the dependency error are not set correctly. Also, uh, they might lead to increased resources consumption uh, if their logic uh, are too complex or the consumer of the result is hidden behind the flag. So one of the example uh, from my experience uh, was noted in the flat list base screen, which allows user to scroll the content. Um, and some part or, or some rows of that flat list and some part of the component tree in that rows gets additional render, even though those components were not visible in the device viewport. So <clears throat> again, utilizing the flipper flame chart and profiling tool, uh, I were able to spot that situation and also figured out that there were one underlying hook that caused one of the property change that um, when passing down through that structure uh, caused some part of that tree uh, to re-render. And th the final result after, because I was able to move that logic away from the row of the component and pass the same prop in different way, I was able to achieve this component structure. So as you can see, there is no uh, additional re-render for the same part of the component tree, providing the same uh, scrolling and the same method of measurements. Mm -hmm. During this investigation, I also uh, used another cool feature included in the flipper, which is called React Native Performance Monitor plugin. And uh, thanks to that uh, plugin, I was able to measure that before my change, the performance score uh, was at 80 points with 37 uh, average JS FPS. And after the result, the measurement shows that the performance score increased to 95 points. And also there were a 55 uh, JS FPS on average. So I encourage you to use that Flipper extension in your app and uh, make a lot of profiling across your app. And the last modification that I would like to uh, mention is connected with the selecting drive mode. If you want to compete on a racetrack, you would, li you would likely have sport or race mode selected to get the best from your car and achieve the best result. At this point, you wouldn't be surprised if I tell you that we have a similar option in React Native. Uh, we as a developer, most of the time, working in the development environment. So uh, each time we develop an app, we have a development build as well for the native uh, or uh, Re React Native sites. However, uh, it's highly recommended that for your measurement, you should use the uh, production version of the app, which is released version of uh, native site as well as JS site. In one of the project, uh, we grab the measurements to benchmark the differences between those environments. And it was a brownfield setup and we measure the app start of the native app, as well as how fast the React Native screen uh, can show its content when invoked from some place of that Brownfield setup. So in the first case, both development builds, and here's the result of that measurement. Uh, the next attempt uh, keeps the development build on the native side. However, uh, we use the release uh, bundle. And as you can see, um, the number, uh, the, the, um, the required number of time to show the React Native screen increased twice. And the best result 
we achieved by using both release um, builds on native side as well as in JS. And actually, the last column proves why it's highly recommended to make a measurements in the uh, production environment, because then uh, you have the mo most similar experience that you, your end user will have. However, it's still possible to provide a measurements on development. However, m more in terms of the benchmark after you provi provide the same measurement step. And after you notice that you change improve the number significantly, then you also might assume that uh, it will be also noticeable on the production. However, still, uh, it's better to double check that. So at this point, uh, we can jump and try to see what potential effect uh, we were able to obtain. As you remember, we started with the um, presented off-road baseline and wanted to be as close as possible to the hypercar. And probably the modification uh, I go through and all of that effort requires spending a lot of time and maybe a lot of money. But in the end, we might end up with this kind of monster. And guess what? I really love it. I think it's a super fast and should bring a lot of joy while driving. However, it also has some drawbacks. It seems to be pretty loud and we also lost some of the flexibility comparing to our base. It also doesn't look like a hypercar, right? So um, the question is, should I bought a hypercar straight away instead of wasting all of the effort and money with the discussion modification? Mm, no, I don't think so. And the conclusion from that story is that everything is possible, but not always cheap and straightforward. You need to take into account that it's much, much easier to put a proper design first place than addressing missing design principles in existing architecture. Uh, that's also the case when performance is uh, afterthought. Also, your end user might not desire the top speed. They might be more interested in having enough fast car to drive comfortable, but have more flexibility on the other uh, in the same time. Uh, so I believe the key here is balance between uh, flexibility and performance. Okay, so the key takeaways are uh, provide a stable and reliable method of measurement for your goal, because then you will be able to trust the number you measured. Set up a baseline to compare the final result it's al it allows you to track your progress. Uh, be methodical and think outside the box because each project has its own specifics. Don't hesitate to achieve quick wins because they really matter in the end of the day. And use a holistic approach, but pay attention to details because then you will receive the best results. And out, out of these five, the last one I would like you to remember most because people tend to either use holistic approach or pay attention to details, but both of these are required to create a great app. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Kuba. Such an amazing analogy, a metaphor, um, car and performance. At Colstack, we have a lot of people skilled in performance optimization, but we also have a few people skilled in driving really fast cars. So like, I guess that's one plus one equals two. Another talk will be reducing bugs in React code base from Atrilabs, Darshita, Chatur Vedi. Hello everyone, 
I'm Darshita and I'll be talking about how to reduce bugs in a React code base. A little bit about me, I'm the maintainer of the open source project A3 Engine, which is a full stack web development framework. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of A3 Labs, which is the company behind this project. My journey to web development industry has been a bit unconventional. After studying engineering, I worked in corn finance and then moved to academic research at MIT. I later dropped out from my graduate program at MIT to work on my startup full time. One personal project that I'm very proud about is that I am editing and managing the publication of a set of novels written by my grandfather over the last five decades. Okay, so on to the talk. As I mentioned earlier, we are creating a full stack web development framework. Using our framework, the front end of a website can be created using our visual editor or by React, writing React code, while its back end can be written in Python. As you can see in this visual editor, there are numerous interactions on one page. For example, we can add components, style them, and move them around. Hence, it's important for us to understand and characterize anti-patterns in our large React code base, because suboptimal code in one interaction can affect the entire application. Moreover, the objective of our framework is to support building production-grade websites. Consequently, building rigorous internal standards on code quality are very important to us. In this talk, I'll share the types of bugs we have identified in our code base and the guardrails we have built to avoid them in future. This discussion is especially important for software engineers who aspire to build similar applications with numerous interactions on one page. Other examples of such softwares include design software such as Canva, Figma, etc. In this talk, we'll cover how to prevent three types of unexpected code behaviors. First, component does not update upon a user event. Second, component updates partially upon a user event. That is, the previous state is still there. And third, component renders unexpectedly. While developing React applications, such bugs often go unnoticed during manual testing and setting up a pipeline for automated testing is difficult. While building our full stack web framework, we were encountering these bugs repeatedly. So our first resort was to use a combination of random print statements, React dev tools, and browser dev tools to fix these bugs one by one. However, we were also aware that we had to add interactive features in our editor at a rapid pace. So we could not go through this inefficient process of finding a cure when a bug occurs. Hence, we decided to review our code multiple times to instead find preventive measures. And this is the origin story of this talk. The central theme comes from official React documentation, that our React code should be independent of the sequence in which components will render and when they will render. We use this theme to codify hints that are easy to remember and can lead us to identify anti-patterns. We think that one way to visualize a React code is as a collection of interdependent pieces of code. Hence, if a code's dependency relationship cannot be established, then there is a high likelihood that it will result in bugs. So the key takeaway here is to be very cautious while using hooks such as useState, useRef, etc that do not take dependency arrays. We will now consider an example app to demonstrate how this hint can help us to identify anti-patterns. But first, let me clarify how we characterize a pattern. There are two considerations. First, the component is reusable. And second, the code is easier to review and debug. Note, that even if we wrote more lines of code or added a few extra renders to achieve these two objectives, we will still consider our code to be following a good pattern. Let us now look at the example. The desired behavior of this app is that when an article is clicked in the left navigation menu, it appears on the right. 
This is followed by two actions. Computation, that is the total character count of the article is calculated as number of characters in the title and plus the number of characters in text. And second is network request. Based on the total character count of the article, an, an emoji is fetched via a network request and displayed here. As the total character count increases, the emoji is, ex is ex expected to change from sad to happy. We'll get to the correct way of building this app in four steps. But first, let's take the incorrect approach. Initially, I'm on article one. The total number of characters in this article is 10 and it's visible here alongside the emoji. But when I select a new article, the corresponding text and title are updated, but the total character count and emoji are not updated. Let's have a look at the code. In line 17, we see the React component, article content, that appears on the right. In line 22, we can see that props have been passed as an initial value for useState. Since useState does not take a dependency array, there is no piece of code that can update the state variable. As a result, computation is not triggered. Moreover, in line 34, we see another interesting thing. Since this length is not updated, the callback to this useState hook is also not called. As a result, the network request is also not triggered. Let us now discuss the partially correct approach. When I select a new article, both the total character count and emoji are updated as expected. However, there is also this annoying flickering effect. One of the ways in which we have observed that developers fix the partial render problem in the previous approach is by using destroy and recreate. It removes the component from DOM and destroys all the hooks and states created during the first function call. This is followed by creating the component again from scratch. Let us now review the code. The only change here is in line 65. Here in the parent of article content component, we are setting the key prop to the article ID. Hence, every time a new article is selected, the article content component is destroyed and recreated. Using this approach, we now get updated computation and network request results. However, this also results in this flickering effect. Let us now move on to the correct but suboptimal approach. Notice that when I change the articles, the flickering effect is no longer visible. To achieve this, instead of using destroy and recreate, we are using re-rendering. Re-rendering refers to calling the React functional component again with the hooks and state intact across function calls. Note that in destroy and recreate, all the hooks and state are destroyed first and then recreated from scratch. To implement re-rendering, we have made following changes to our code. In line 64, you can see that the, we are no longer using key in the parent component. Similarly, here we are using use state and use effect in tandem. And we are using props as a dependency in the use effect. Thus, we are circumventing the lack of dependency array in use state through use effect. This approach is correct. However, it is suboptimal because the computation is being done every time props change, which in turn starts another rendering. Finally, let us look at the correct and optimal way of building this application. Recall that we went down this rabbit hole because we had used a hook with no dependency array. Instead of trying to make use state work somehow with patchwork, let us switch to a hook that takes dependencies. So in line 22 here, we are moving, we have moved the total character count computation to use memo hook. And thus we are able to prevent extra render. When we applied this refactoring to our framework, we were able to drastically reduce the number of use state per component. Our current status is at 0.35. To give you a context of the size of our code base, it has 112 custom hooks and 192 components.
there are many other ways to avoid unnecessary use state. Here, we are demonstrating this using a custom slider component. The code on the left has anti-patterns. For example, there are four use state and three callbacks. The start position state records the initial position of cursor. The code on right is the refactored version of this code. Note that we do not have any use state and only one callback because we have used the local context of the callback to store all the ongoing information related to user interactions. Also, we have avoided the value state by converting the component into a controlled component. We are aware that there is an active debate on the use of control components, but we believe that the control components should be preferred when the number of interactions per page is high. The next hint for bugs was use of nesting for arranging components. Note that while using nesting, if we are not paying attention, we might pass down duplicate states to children. This may lead to inconsistencies of states between parent and children. Recall that our code should be independent of the sequence in which components will render. Moreover, there should be a single source of truth for each state, otherwise it will result in bugs. The second thing to note here is that tracing changes in state is one of the most time consuming steps in debugging. Since nesting allows change in state at each level, it takes longer to debug. So to summarize, be extra careful when you're using hooks without dependency. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. So, uh, yeah, it was a pretty clear and easy to follow algorithm of how to find bugs in your React code base. So I will definitely watch it again and try to find out if I misuse some of those patterns. Okay, next up. Next up, we have a talk with a title, Getting Better All the Time, How to Escape Bad Code. And from Big Nerd Ranch, Josh Justice. This is Getting Better All the Time, How to Escape Bad Code. I'm Josh Justice, and I work at Big Nerd Ranch. I want to say thanks to the organizers for letting me be here, and to everyone else watching, I'm glad you're here. Maybe you can help me out with something. I have to work with some really bad code right now. Now, no offense to whoever wrote it, I assume it was good enough for the time, and I've written my share of bad code myself, but I'm just telling you how I really feel right now. It is code that's really hard to work with at the moment. Let me show you some of it. There's some really long components that I could show you, a couple thousand lines, but that's a little overwhelming for a conference talk. So instead, I found a smaller one, but it's still one that shows a lot of the problems that I'm experiencing. So I have a screen here. It's a restaurant list and a restaurant app. Um, we can see pasta place, salad place. We can add a new restaurant. I'm in an ice cream kind of mood, and it gets added in there. You can see my backend server is a little bit slow, but I'm doing my best. I can also delete. But notice there's no loading state on the delete button when I delete it. It just takes a few seconds for the server to load it, and then it disappears. And that's the change that I've been asked to work on, is to add a loading state, a deleting state, for the delete button for a row. So let's take a look at the code and see how we can do this. As I go through here, I've got a restaurant list component. It's taken in some pretty typical props, a list of restaurant, a loading and load error uh, prop, and a reload function. Now, as I go through here, uh, there's a name state. What name is that? I, maybe it's the new restaurant name. I can't really tell. Um, there's an adding state that's true or false. That's probably the add button loading. There's also an update error message. Well, we're not really updating here. We're adding and deleting. Is, is it one of those? Is it both? I'm not sure. We're returning early if it's, we're loading or have an error with a little message that shows up. Um, I'll reload to let you see that loading message in here. This pops up a little loading message. Now let's look at the JSX. All right, so there's a lot of nested components here. We're using low-level React Native built-in components. Um, multiple levels of nesting, and check this out. We have an inline on-press event handler. It's a multi-line function, including a fairly complicated promise chain. Wow, okay, that's a lot. Also, my team prefers async and await, so that takes a little bit, bit to process, but we'll keep moving on. Um, and in the flat list, we've got the render item. That's inline JSX in there as well, just embedded in that function. Also, some unclear variable names. Um, 
item, like what is item down here, uh, so a little bit hard to follow. Also, when I scroll down to the very bottom, all the styles for all these components are included in line. And because they're all in this one file, there's a lot going on in the style sheet, and it's a bit hard to follow. So looking at this code, I have a guess as to why the original developer added a loading state for the add button, but not the delete button. There's a single add button, so it's easy to add one loading state at the top. But because each row is in, in line in the JSX here, there's not an easy way to add state there. You can maybe add an ID at the top or a row number of what's currently being deleted, maybe even an array of row numbers, but it's just kind of complicated and maybe the developer thought, nobody's asked me for this explicitly, I'm just gonna move on. It was hard to work with because the code was already bad, it was already challenging at that time. And yet I've been tasked with working with it now. Now this component's only 150 lines long, so like you and I could get by with this, like we could get, make it work, um, but it shows a lot of the problems that show up in larger components and larger sets of bad code as well. So what do I do about bad code? Now note that here, I don't have any particular definition of bad code in mind. All I mean is that code where it's difficult to make the change that I need to make right now. Sometimes code, in fact, was totally sufficient for when it was written, but now that a new requirement has come in, a new need has come up, and the code doesn't fit well, and it's hard to know how to proceed. So what do you do about bad code? Maybe you're working with some right now. Maybe it's a lot bigger than the component I showed. Maybe it's so complex you can't even figure out all of what it does. So if you're like me, some options you might take are, you might try to work around the bad code. Just leave it as it is, make the minimum line changes to get things working and move on and try never to think about it again. Um, that can be hard though. It can be slow to understand that code. It can be slow to make the change. And then if you introduce a bug, it can be slow to identify and fix it. The development will go fairly slow. Also, when you add in workarounds, you're not making the code any better. So this means the next time that you or another developer has to make a change, it'll be even slower. There's now more messy code to have to work through. So working around it doesn't make things better in the long term. What about rewriting bad code? That's another option. Um, I can say, we've had enough. This is, we cannot go any further. We need to rewrite it and do it right this time or do it right for the new situation this time. This can be appealing. But also, um, rewriting is a big chunk of work that doesn't deliver features to the user and that can't be interrupted. What I mean is, if you're halfway through a rewrite and then an urgent request comes in for a bug fix, you uh, need to decide what to do. You can put that work on hold, do the bug fix, and then pick it back up, and then roll the bug fix back in, and then hope that another bug fix doesn't come along before you're done the rewrite. Or you can say no to the user and no to the business and say, I need to finish my rewrite first before I fix your urgent problem. That tends to not go over very well. Also, when you're doing a rewrite, if you break it, you own it. You've now restructured the code, you initiated this work, the business maybe didn't ask for it, and yet now there's a problem that a user is experiencing. It, we don't want to see those problems happen for users and it reflects poorly on us as developers. It doesn't aid the business goals. So rewrite is often not a great choice and working around it isn't a great choice either. So what do we do about bad code? This is hard. This is one of the core challenges and stressors for develops and for developers. We can feel stuck. Wait a second. I just remembered something. Something that changes everything. This component has thorough tests. And I'm talking about really thorough. If the tests pass, I have a really high confidence that the component is working. And if a test fails, I can be pretty sure something's really gone wrong that I need to fix. When you have tests like this, you have a third option for dealing with bad code. I can make it better as I go. Let's take a look at how. We've got our test running here, our test for the restaurant list component that I'm asserting are really good and we can trust. We'll come back to that a little later in the presentation. So let's take a look and see what we can do to move towards implementing this feature of the deleting loading state. Well, the first thing that makes it hard for me to process this component is the inline functions in the event handlers. It's just hard for me to see JSX and then think about logic, especially asynchronous logic at the same time. So let's pull these out into functions. I'm just gonna cut this function here. I'm gonna call it handle add. I'm gonna add a handle add function up here. Let's make it a const so we can just paste in the uh, arrow function directly. I'm gonna save and let Jess rerun the tests to see if everything's still working fine. And it does. Now let's do the same for the delete function here. Call it handle delete. We introduce a handle delete variable, paste in that function and save. 
Oh, now ESLint is warning me about something. Item is not defined. Let's see what the tests say. Item is not defined as well. Okay. So what's going wrong here is that inside our flat list, we had an item argument that was being made available, but it's not available outside of the context of that. We can fix this by passing item here. Pass into the function, save, and let the test rerun. And it passes. Now a note about TypeScript. TypeScript would have caught this error as well and a number of other structural errors around, move, around moving code around. So you might ask, if I have TypeScript, do I need these thorough tests as well? TypeScript is really helpful, but one of the things it doesn't verify is the runtime behavior of your program. So you get extra confidence by having tests that really cover the behavior of your code, and that's some of what helps you to be able to make it better all the time. All right, so I've extracted these functions and we're good. Another convention my team has is that we use function keyword functions instead of arrow functions in cases like this. So let's make that change. It's just gonna make it a little bit easier for people to parse this as they go through. I feel confident about making both of these changes at once. Here we're gonna to need to actually add in curlies as the arrow function didn't have curlies before. We save and let the test run. Now while this is running, I'm gonna think ahead. Another convention that my team has is using async await syntax instead of promise chains. That's what we're used to seeing, so promise chains are just a little bit harder, slows us down a bit. Let's refactor this code to use async await. We'll do one function at a time this time. I'm gonna do a try block because I have an exception here. Await for post, and then await reload restaurants and set name and set adding, and then we do a catch. Save, and we'll make sure that everything is still good at this point. Yep, we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same with handle delete. And await, await, catch. Very easy for me to forget and await somewhere, so the assurance of the test is really helpful when I'm making a change like this. Here's an extra line break I probably don't need. So everything's still looking good. Great, so now we have this tricky asynchronous log uh, logic up in a place that I can see it separately and in the form that my team is used to. The next thing that comes to mind is this variable name, item. What's an item? Our app works with restaurants, not items. So this actually is a restaurant, and we can rename this variable safely. Let's scroll down as well, there's some items here. And here, this is probably where the item came from. Um, we can rename it though, because it's a named argument, but we can give it a new name. Change it to restaurant, save, and make sure that everything is still good. There, now, how do I want to implement the delete status? Well, there's this inline JSX for each row, but if I pulled out each restaurant row into its own component, I could add its own state in there that it could track to track when it was deleting. So let's do this one step at a time. I'm gonna copy this inline JSX and create a new component. We'll create it in the same file, at least for now, to make it easy. We can call it restaurant row. I'm gonna let ESLint tell me what arguments I need to pass into it. So I'm gonna save. I need a restaurant, so that's fine. Now let's think about this handle delete function. It's not typical in React components to pass in a data item and then a function that's going to be passed that same data item back. It's more typical just to have an event handler. Maybe it wouldn't even be given any arguments, but you can just define outside what you want the functionality to be. So I think I'm going to do that. We can call this on delete. We can paste that into here. Now when we implement restaurant row up above, replacing this existing code, we can say restaurant row with restaurant equals restaurant. And then we say on delete, and there we can pass in this handler function. Delete the other JSX and save. And because of the way React Native Testing Library renders out your full component tree, even though this is pulled out into a child component now, our tests of deleting and tests of rendering out the names of the restaurants are still gonna pass. We're testing these, this parent component and child components in integration, and that allows us to do this kind of refactoring. Now that we have a restaurant row component, it's a convenient place to put the state for the deleting. So let's do that. Call it deleting, false by default. And now let's create an async function, call it handle delete. It's gonna handle this. First, we're gonna set deleting to true. Then we're gonna call await 
on delete, calling out to the parent for that delete functionality. Then after we're done, we're going to call set deleting false. We're going to use handle delete for the button handler instead of calling on delete directly. And now we have a deleting prop that we can use to add the styling and the disabling as we like here. So first we can change the text. We can say if we're deleting, then say deleting. Otherwise, just say delete. We can also disable the pressable. And finally, we can add some styling here. There's some styling up above for uh, when the text is disabled. And in this case, we'll say when we're deleting, style it with button text disabled. I'm going to save and make sure that we haven't broken any of the existing functionality as we added in this new functionality. Now, as a note here, in a real application, I'd be writing a test alongside this new functionality to make sure it's covered as well for the next time we need to refactor. For expediency in this talk, we'll just write the functionality. The test all passed, so we're good. So now let's take a look in the app and let's see it running. Reload the page just to make sure we get a fresh start. Loads up. Let's add that ice cream place again. We click add. We still have that nice loading state there. Now let's click delete. Ah, nice deleting state. It's showing up okay. Oh, we got a warning though. Can't perform a React state update on an unmounted component. So because I've gone through this before, I know what's going on. After on delete succeeds, the row is removed. But then after that, we call set deleting false, and we're setting the state on this unmounted component. So the way we can handle this here is that we can put this in a try block, and then only in the case of an error do we set deleting to false. We don't actually need to set it to false if the row is going away to begin with. Let's save this. Let's try it one more time. Ice cream place. Now let's delete it. And it deletes nicely and cleanly. So let's look back over what we've done. We were able to make these changes one bit at a time to get to the component to a state where we have the asynchronous logic in one place, we have the JSX in another place. We pulled out the restaurant row child component and we're able to easily add state to it in a very simple way once we have that child component pulled out. Now you might say to yourself, hey, we have another component up here, or a set of components, the adding row, that would be nice to pull that out as well. It's nice to have this higher level abstraction of a restaurant row. It would be nice to have an add restaurant form as well. And one of the nice things about this approach to testing is that we can do that change now or later. The test will cover us to allow us to move it out. And so if it's easy and useful for us now, we can pull it out at this time. Or if it's not, we can leave it and wait it until somebody needs to work on that form and make it pull it out then. The test will be there ready for us to cover that functionality. So I don't know about you, but for me, that was pretty fun. It was certainly a lot better than leaving bad code and having to deal with it over and over again. And it was a lot better than taking on the risk of a rewrite and the problems that it could call, uh, cause by rewriting it all at once. Now, if you like this approach, then good news. I didn't just make it up. It's a thing. It's called refactoring. Now, the definition of refactoring from Martin Fowler's original book is small changes that improve the arrangement of the code without changing its functionality. We ran the test, and the test confirmed that the functionality was not changed. And because the tests run automatically and quickly, you can run them after every small change so you can take really small steps. So why would you make small changes like that? Well, one of the benefits is value. You're making the improvements that pay off right away. You're not having to do all of it and change all of it at once. You're making the changes that help you do what you need. So you're getting a high amount of value. This also makes it easier to fit this into your normal work so you don't need to do a big separate refactoring task. You just refactor as a way of implementing the story that you're working on. Small changes are also helpful for delivery. Code is shippable after each refactoring. If I got an urgent bug fix in the middle of that refactoring process, I could have pushed up a PR with the changes I had so far, got them reviewed, merged down, started working on that big bug fix, but the code is already cleaner and more helpful in the meantime, and it'll be ready for me to pick it up and continue the refactoring process to add in that new feature later. So those are some of the benefits of small changes. Now, a lot of people use the word refactoring in a more broad sense these days for any kind of rewrite or any kind of code change. And what matters most is not the term. What matters most is I want you to have the category of thinking for this kind of process, making small changes to make the code better under test. So what do we do about bad code? We have the option to make it better all the time. And you can make better just the parts that you touch. You don't have to pick between leaving all the problems in place and trying to do an enormous task of making everything better all at once. You can make it better all the time. If, there's an if, and it's a big if.
You can make it better all the time if you have comprehensive tests you can trust. Well, there's the catch, right? You might say, trust our test. I can hardly stand our test. A lot of us have bad experience with tests where the tests are incomplete, they're flaky, they're unhelpful, and they actually prevent change rather than making it easier. So in light of that experience that many of us have, is it even possible to get comprehensive tests that you can trust? It may seem impossible, but there is one way, test-driven development. So what test-driven development is, is a three-step process where you write the test before you write the production code. Step one is you write a test and you see it fail for the new functionality you want. Step two, you write just enough code to make the test pass. And in step three, you refactor. You rearrange the production code or the test code to make it simpler and easier. This is also referred to as red, green refactor. And the first step is red because the new test you write is red. Then you make it green, you make it pass. Then you refactor. There's no color for that step. If you want to be able to refactor the way that I've shown to be able to make it better as you go, TDD is totally doable and will get you there. So let's take a look at how. We're going to rewind time to before this component was written, and we're going to test drive out the component to get to the point where you have that test coverage you can use to refactor the way that we did. So we're now back at the start. We have our restaurant list that's just an empty component, and our restaurant spec that is just a little bit of test data that's empty. And our test runner says that our test suite must contain at least one test. So we're ready to write. All right, so what do we want to do to build out this component? What functionality do we need it to have? First thing we need that comes to mind for me is displaying the names of the restaurants. So let's write a test for that. Uh, when restaurants are loaded, it displays the restaurant names. We're using Jest and React Native testing library as is extremely common in the React Native world. So we're going to render out the component. We're going to pass in these restaurants, this test data that's been set up here, just with an ID and a name. That's all that's needed. And then we're going to check for the restaurant names. Expect screen dot query by text. Uh, and we do restaurants zero name to be truthy. That is, it's not null, it is actually found in the document. We'll do the same for restaurant one name. We're going to save, and this is our red step, so we expect the test to fail. And it does. The restaurant name is not found. Now for the second step, the green step, what is the simplest change we can make the code to get the test to pass? Now you could say we can just output text components, that is simple, but this is React Native, we know it's going to be a flat list or something similar, so it's okay for us to go ahead and use a flat list there. Our test will actually continue to pass even if we need to change to something else in the future. So let's get that going. We're going to take, take in the restaurants, we're going to render a flat list, the data is the restaurants, key extractor, we're going to take a cue from our previous refactor there and Go ahead and call it restaurant, and then uh, render item. And here we're just going to say text restaurant name. And I got to close my tags, and this should be enough to get the test to pass. And it does. Great. So well, let's keep moving on. We don't need to pull up the simulator yet. We can check that out a little bit later. So what other scenarios do we need to cover? Well, there's the error state as well. We want to show an error message if we can't load the restaurants. So let's describe that scenario. When there is a loading error, it displays an error message. I'm going to run into the restaurant list again, load error, and that's just a Boolean prop, so that'll be load error is true. And then we're going to look for that error message. An error occurred loading the restaurants. Just deciding on the error message we want to be there. Save, and we're in the red step. So this should fail as it tells us the new functionality we need to add to the component. All right, we need to get this error message showing. What's the simplest way to do that? Simplest way is just to stick it directly into the JSX here. Let's add the rest of this fragment. I'm going to pull in a text. And just add that message. Save and let the test pass. Now you may be extremely confused or worried about what I just did because I just made the error message show unconditionally. Obviously that's not what we actually want to happen. We don't want the error message always to show. But here's a reason to follow the green step 
fairly rigidly and write the simplest code to make the test pass. Yes, we want the error message to sometimes not show, but we want to make sure we have a test for that scenario so that we can be confident in our future refactors. So we write the simple things now, and then we think, what test do I need to write to drive me to the richer behavior that I need? In this case, what we want to do is thinking about the scenario when the restaurants are successfully loaded, we want the error message not to show. So now we add that condition to that test uh, to make sure uh, it's covered before we write that logic. In this test, we can add this here and we can say expect uh, that message to be null, meaning it's not found in the component. We save, we're back in the red step now. And the test fails. We expected that message to be missing, but it was in fact found. That's what all this nonsense means. So now we have a test driving us to add in the logic. We can look for a load error. We can say if load error, turn the error message. And now this should call, cause both of the tests to pass. So the error shows when it should, and it is hidden when it should be. They pass. All right, what other functionality do we need here? We need a loading state as well. Conceptually, I think of that as before the restaurant's being there. So let's put it at the top of the file. Describe while loading. It displays a loading indicator. Render out the component again. You have a loading prop. Now in a real application, you might have a loading icon and there might be some accessibility attributes that you'd use to look it up to make sure that it's loading and that's available to screen readers as well. For simplicity here, we're just gonna use a text label as well as we saw earlier. So we're gonna expect um, screen query by text loading to be truthy. We expect a loading message and this is the red step. This should fail because we haven't yet added the loading message. That'll come next. It does. Now we're gonna follow the same approach to take the simplest possible way to get this test to pass by unconditionally showing the loading message. That works. So now, when do we want the loading message not to show? Well, we can just look through our different scenarios we have on here and we can decide when to do that. When the restaurants are loaded, we don't want the loading message to show. So we can paste in that condition here and say to be null. We save. This should fail. We're back at the red step. So how do we get the loading message to hide in that case? Well, we actually look at the loading prop. If loading, we return that message. And this should cover all of our scenarios. All of them should pass. Great. Now, is there any other scenarios where we don't want the loading message to show? Well, when there's a loading error, we don't want loading to show. Now, interestingly, based on the way we've written the code, I think that this test will pass right away. So this is not actually TDD at this point. We're writing the test that passes from the start, but it's still good for extra assurance to get those comprehensive tests that will cover all the behavior we need of the component to support future refactoring. So I'm gonna save, it's gonna go green right away, and that's good. Now I've glossed over the refactoring step of TDD so far, and you don't need to refactor after every time you go through, but you keep an eye out for duplication or other things that are complex that you want to remove. In our case, this, these repeated text strings in here make me nervous. I'm nervous that if the text changes in the future, we might get false positives or false negatives and that they may not all match up. So let's extract them to uh, variables. Loading message is equal to loading. And now we use that variable in all these tests. Loading, this ensures we're looking for the same string each time. We'll also pull this one, load error message. We'll replace that in all of the tests as well. Save, and we make sure that during this refactor, that all of the tests, that the tests still pass afterwards. Now, the last thing we could do is a little bit of styling here. As a good presenter, I've written my styles in advance because that's not what we're focusing on here. So let's plot these styles into the component. And because we've written a test that isn't depending on any of the styling or any of the child components used, our test should continue to run as we add the styling in. There's a message style there, an 
error style we add on on there. And here we actually want to add in a view component as well. We put around the row. Restaurant row and the text is restaurant name. And before I save this, let's take a look at the running code. So it works, but it looks extremely plain. It's very simple. There's not a lot going on there. So let's now save these changes to add these styles in. Oh, I forgot to import style sheet. All right, now we have separators. So this is now a real list. That's very nice. If we reload, there's at least a little bit of spacing around the loading message, so that's nice. And if we temporarily hard code the load error to true, we can see a red error message. So we have some styling now but all of the tests are still passing. So we have the safety to make visual changes, other changes to implementation details of the component, um, and our tests still cover us and give us assurance there. Now, we don't have time to run through the whole TDD process in this presentation to get back up to the point that we started from, but if you go to reactnativetesting.io slash getting better, you'll be able to see the rest of the sequence here. Um, the rest of the TDD of all the steps, including adding and deleting. You'll be able to see more refactors like extracting the add form, extracting those com child components to other files, and switching to React Native Paper. You'll also see testing child components directly and a discussion of whether you would or wouldn't want to do that. There's also resources for learning more about test-driven development in React Native. So there are a number of benefits of test-driven development. Um, it helps you catch more bugs. It can influence the design of your code in positive ways. But I believe the biggest benefit of test-driven development is that it equips you to make your code better all the time. It equips you to refactor. Now, you don't need to write tests exactly like mine. That's not the point. The point is, write whichever kinds of tests give you confidence to make it better all the time. Maybe that's different granularity for you. Maybe that's a different testing tool. On React on the web, that'll certainly be different. But whatever tests give you that confidence to be able to make changes in small steps and to feel good that you haven't broken anything, that's what you need. Now you might say in response, and a number of people do, TDD is too much work. And it is true that it takes effort to learn it and it takes effort to apply it ongoing. But you know what else is a lot of work? Living with bad code forever. And that is not work that I want to do. I do not find that motivating. I want to escape bad code. You're gonna deal with bad code somehow. You don't want to work around it and you often can't rewrite it. It's not usually, it's often not an option. So there's one way I know of to escape bad code and that's to make it better all the time by using refactoring and thorough test coverage. Now, imagine what would happen if more of us tried to write software this way. Imagine coming into a new code base totally confident that you could trust the tests because the previous developer used test-driven development to cover it. At that point, it wouldn't matter very much how bad the code is or how new and different the requirements are because you could always rearrange the code to fit the new situation. That would be a really great place to work and a really great situation to be in. That's where I want to be. TDD leads to great tests. Great tests allow you to make it better all the time, and making it better all the time leads to great code. I'm Josh Justice. I'm a principal architect at Big Nerd Branch. We build apps with React Native and native iOS and Android and web apps as well. Um, let us know if we can help you. We also do corporate training. If you go to reactnativetesting.io slash getting better, there's ways to get in touch with us. Thanks so much, and I hope you've gotten something helpful out of this. Josh, I'm very much impressed. So I love a good refactoring story, and it was a great one. Thank you so much. Uh, as a side note, great superhero name. Awesome. Josh Justice. Almost four hours of conference has passed, and, to, and we still have like hundreds of people watching us live. So if you are one of those person watching us live after four hours of conference, I think you might be a good fit to write to our HR department at hr at callstack.com and look at the job offerings. Maybe, maybe you are a good fit. We will have a 15 minutes break now and we will be back in 15 minutes for four uh, talks, for last talks for today. See you in 15 minutes. This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts.
Hello. Hey. Welcome after the break. I hope it was a restful 15 minutes. I hope you are all rested and ready for the last part of today's conference. We still have four talks for you, and the first one is Showcase of RN Emoji Keyboard Library Enhance Your Communication with the Language of Emoji from the Vidlash Group, Magda Jaśkowska. Hi, I'm Magda from the Village Group company. Um, we specialize in React Native, and when we don't work for our clients, we build some useful open source libraries to make your life easier. And today we will focus on how to enhance our communication with emojis. We're gonna go through why to choose emoji, what impact they actually have, what emoji is. Uh, we'll dive into some technical details and a little bit of theory about how it works under the hood and how to bring emojis into your React Native apps. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, emojis have the ability to pick up where actual words are falling slightly short. They empower our feelings, our words. More than 90% of the users use emojis on a daily basis. Every year, new and more relatable emojis are introduced in order to meet the rising demand and basically keep up with all the changes. Nowadays, we are so reliant on our mobile phones that we reach for them constantly without even realizing. And let's stop for a little longer here. Um, let me ask you a question. What did your phone do for you today? Did it send you a notification that your latest YouTube video got 100 more thumbs up? Um, did it let you know that your message on Slack got a fire reaction? Maybe someone liked your Instagram picture of your yesterday's dinner? Or your fr best friend sent you a middle finger just because? Well, emojis are everywhere. They are an integral part of our lives, whether we like it or not. When speaking, people convey the information with eye gaze, tone of voice, facial expression, in general, the whole body language, something that is obviously missing while we're texting. Let's have a look at this conversation between two partners, a couple. Pretty standard, but there's something missing. Do you feel any emotional connection between these two people? Well, looks a little bit like good grounds for a divorce. And how about now? Completely different vibe, right? So you can see how adding just a few emojis changes the feel of the whole conversation. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Let's move to another example. I just fell down the stairs. If I received that kind of text with no context whatsoever, my response probably would be something like, oh my God, do you need help? Um, okay, but let's see how adding emojis changes that context. Laughing? Well, apparently my friend is just really clumsy. Um, so I would say, <laughs> happens to me all the time, just please be careful next time. Um, but what if we provide some more specific context? An ambulance emoji. So my answer would probably be, which hospital are they taking you to? I'll be right there. You see where I'm going with this, right? Um, emojis break the language barrier because they are universal. They are widely recognizable, regardless of the language you speak. I will go one step further and say that it is possible to have a full conversation without the need of using too many words, just emoji itself. So one person didn't use words at all, and we still have a fully understandable conversation. So emoji started gaining popularity on such a massive scale as it is right now, around 10 years ago. Obviously they were with us a little earlier, but they were quickly recognized as a phenomenon and as a proof of that. A while later, Oxford Dictionary announced that the word of the year 2015 
is not a word. It is emoji. The tears of joy emoji. So tears of joy emoji is still very popular. In fact, it is the most used emoji of 2021. 5% uh, of the total emojis used, so quite big. But what is emoji? So from the technical point of view, it is a sign defined by the Unicode standard. A picture represented by uncoded character. It does not really differ too much from any other alphabet letter that you can see on the screen. Like shown, uh, a, letters A, code point is U0041, letter B42, and so on, the whole alphabet. And the rocket emoji, for example, would be 1F680, so the same format. Let's also quickly go through what the Unicode is. Um, it is an information technology standard for the consistent coding, and it is maintained by the Unicode Consortium. Pro basically provides a unique number code point for every character. That is the goal. So does it mean that emoji is a font? Well, yes. If this is a font, does it mean that we can change its style depending on the font family we use? Yes. The answer is also yes. It works exactly like that, and this is why some of the emojis look slightly different depending on the platform or app where they are displayed. So if an app does not include a font that supports displaying that emoji, it will automatically fall back to what the manufacturer of your phone has provided. It's as simple as that. And for example, the font that Apple uses for emojis is called Apple Color Emoji, Android Not All Color Emoji, and so on. Each of these uh, take control over how emojis are displayed. And they actually can make some modifications to any of them if they want to. So you can see an example of fries, how it looks depending on the environment where they are displayed. Okay, let's talk flags. As I mentioned before, every emoji should have its dedicated con point. But no, this is not the case for flags. Uh, they are so-called flag sequences, uh, combining regional indicator symbols, for example, PL, GB, and so on. Each of these regional indicator symbols combined together create a country flag. Do you think that we can do some JavaScript magic on emojis? Uh, let's see what happens when we, do, uh, when we add two regional indicator symbols together. And we end up having a British flag. Would any other JavaScript method work on flag? Yeah, we can also try reversing. And after reversing the Bulgarian flag, which is the combination of B and G, uh, we, we end up having also British flag. Surrogate pairs. Most JavaScript engines use UTF-16 encoding by default. Characters like emoji have a very high code point, so they cannot be stored uh, in 16 bits. They require 21 bits to save the information. So the UTF-16 says, hey, you need two code units of 16 bits. So the code point 1F600, like that one on top, is split into a so-called surrogate pair. A uh, high surrogate code unit on the left and the low surrogate code unit, that one on the right. And to prove that, we can simply call length on emoji, which is going to result in two. Skin tone modifiers. Unicode has approved skin tone modifiers from Unicode 8.0, which was released in 2015. Uh, it can be applied to a range of human-like emojis, and these six colors that you can see on the screen is the Fitzpatrick scale, which represents human skin phototype. However, Unicode has introduced its own version of this scale, which includes five skin tones. And skin tone modifiers are not like other emojis. They do not exist separately. You cannot choose them from any keyboard. However, combined with emoji that supports skin tone modifiers will result in that original emoji changing color, like so. And here's a woman. We pasted skin tone modifier, and we have emoji that represents women with a darker skin tone. So please notice that the skin tone modifier is visible here as just a square, so it kind of broke when I tried to paste it into the code editor. This actually proves that this is not a standalone emoji, and it shouldn't be used as such. 
So coming back to the test we did before, what would happen if we check the length of the emoji that includes skin tone modifier? Well, yeah, we're going to get four, two per each element, emoji itself and the skin tone modifier. Zero with joiner. Um, it's a Unicode character that basically joins two or more other characters together in a sequence to create a new emoji. It is also not an emoji itself and it has no appearance. It is invisible. So when I'll be showing you an example, some examples in a second, you'll have to believe me that I actually pasted something in between two emojis. Um, let's see that in action. Uh, woman plus zero with joiner plus laptop is going to give us woman technologies emoji. What a coincidence. No mouth emoji plus fog, face in the clouds. Uh, we can also use both at the same time, skin tone modifier and zero joiner to create even more customizable emojis. Uh, here, woman plus dark, darker skin tone plus red hair. Family. Combining men, woman, gay, girl and boy emojis give us a bunch of options to create family emojis. But does it really work with any kind of sequence? Well, not really. Unicode supports quite a lot of combinations already, uh, but not everything is available yet. And for example, can a family be mixed with a dog? Well, unfortunately, not yet. Maybe one day. Um, so as you already know, we can achieve lots of combinations joining together two random emojis, but there are some that feel a little bit like a missed opportunity. And combining two eyes will not give us an ice emoji. Ice emoji has its own code point. And same goes for lipstick mark, unicorn, zombie guy, or a vampire. Right, so let's move to the part where we discuss how to incorporate emojis into your apps. Um, feel free to scan the QR code if you want to find out uh, more. And I'll move to presenting an emoji keyboard an open source library created and maintained by developers from the Vidlaj group. Uh, special recognition to the originator, Jacob, who makes sure that all the best features land regularly in the releases. Okay, but you may wonder, why did we decide to build an emoji picker library? There must have been something on the market already. Well, yes, of course there was. We were in the process of building our company's demo app, Holly Daily. Um, and yeah, we did our research, we tried to incorporate some of the existing solutions into the app. Um, and the main feature that we needed that library for in the first place was allowing users to tag posts with any emoji they wanted. Not just a heart or a thumbs up emoji. I mean, call us greedy, but we wanted it all. And our go-to library was React Native Emoji Selector. We gave it a go, but it wasn't something that we expected or looked for. Um, we needed something more. We needed more customization, more control, better performance. So we eventually decided to release the emoji keyboard and then emoji selector has become our benchmark. So RN emoji keyboard gives you an option for a keyboard to be used as a static element, which is an integrated part of the UI, like you can see on the, on the screen. Um, please notice that I am using a named import here and the only required prop in this mode is on emoji selected, which obviously handles, it handles emoji selection. Or um, we can use the modal mode where the keyboard pops up when opened and here using the default import from the library and we just pass three required props. You can also grab that top part, the knob, uh, and drag it to the, to the very top in order to expand the whole keyboard and give it almost, well, well actually, even full screen. Um, we added multiple features for the keyboard that you can control by just simply passing some props. Um, for example, change emo emoji si size. Here's very small, or you can also go very big. Um, display a recently used section or hide it. Uh, displays that categories list on top, at the bottom, of heavy floating, which is actually the default setting. Uh, you can customize colors. Here the custom theme 
for an active category icon, um, you can have a search bar, you can style that search bar, passing props theme, um, or go crazy with some more styling, more custom styling. You can hide that search bar if you don't want it. You can hide the header as well and have a very clear layout. Uh, you can disable categories so you can only see your selected ones. Um, or you can even change the order of this category if you wish to. And something that our keyboard has been missing for a while now, but here it is. Uh, we added it with the latest releases, release that happened just recently, well actually yesterday. Um, skin tone modifier support provided to you by default with no additional setup. Um, and to wrap up with the library showcase, I gathered some points for us to go through. Uh, let's start with easy setup. You don't need any provider, nothing. It just works by default. Um, it is user and developer friendly. Uh, fully type, uh, so feel free to take advantage of the autocomplete. Uh, internationalization, we already support a bunch of the languages, but if you don't see your language on that list, I highly encourage you to contribute to the library with your own translations. Um, skin tone modifier support. Um, it is written as a React Native component, so no linking needed, and something that we're also very proud of, zero dependency. So like I mentioned before, emoji selector was our benchmark. Um, we ran some performance tests on it beforehand, and that gave us the rough idea of what we're going to go, like what we're going to be dealing with, where we could expect some challenges, and what those challenges could be. Um, let me show you what RN Perf Monitor plugin for Flipper showed us. Uh, so the library struggled a little bit with the initial render on such a long list. Um, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of emojis here to be rendered. Um, we can also see a big drop on the category change uh, or even the selection of the emoji itself. And uh, um, uh, React Native uh, Emoji Selector scored 49. So here is how our emoji keyboard looked like in the first release. This is the first ever version that ended up in NPM. Um, very similar to the other one, I'm afraid. We fell into the similar traps, but obviously um, we do not, did not stop on that. Our first score was 46. And soon after that, we released the version of 071, which was the longest stable version of the library. Um, we've put some effort into optimizing the library. Um, you could, by doing some caching and everything, like you can see that the drop of the performance is not so uh, spectacular as the previous version. And we ended up with the score of 72. But like I mentioned, we recently released the new version of the library. Lots of breaking changes in that one. Uh, here, the team has put a lot of effort in order to achieve our best score so far. Uh, with all the recent improvements, we were able to significantly reduce the drop uh, in the G JS FPS, um, especially on the category change. I think you can see that it's pretty stable, and the UI FPS looks like a straight line. And we end up having this final score, 90. Yeah, but obviously our ultimate goal is yet to be achieved, uh, and that's what we're aiming for. Okay, so I hope you can all agree with me right now that I can allow myself to add to that list one more point. An emoji keyboard is performant. Uh, feel free to check out the documentation for this library to find out more. And to sum up, if there was one thing that I would like you to remember from my talk today, it would be allow your users to fully express themselves by giving them the right tools. Because people are used to emojis. Do it like we did it. Give them the possibility to tag with any emoji, not just a heart. Use the RN emoji keyboard. Use other libraries and stuff that our team is building for you. Uh, you might be familiar with React Native Notificated. 
uh, the only in-app notification library that you will ever need, uh, which had its grand premiere at AppJS just a few months ago. Um, check out our demo app, Holy Daily, and have a look at the in-depth articles about React Native and animations in Reanimated. That's it for me today. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>
E, imagine that a couple of teams working uh, a same repository, opening pull request, running on same pipeline. Uh, it was horrible because each team uh, has their own development process, has own testing strategy or stuff like that. Uh, it was very horrible. Uh, so it was hard to work on single repository with many teams. Uh, also, our team velocity has decreased uh, day by day. Uh, in a single project, uh, the ownership should be well, well defined, uh, but with monolithic application structure, uh, it's 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 not clear. Uh, it it was not clear. Um, it becomes hard to test our code uh, when other 20 developers pushing to the same repository. Uh, it, it makes much more sense to be able to test the smallest piece of code uh, that was changed uh, in an isolated way. So uh, with these problems, uh, we need to fix uh, something and uh, we have some goals. Uh, we need to create a clear boundaries across the team uh, and then end of the day uh, we are JavaScript developer, uh, we are a front-end developer and uh, the future oriented teams don't need to know native code, uh, just develop the business logic with JavaScript uh, including UI. Uh, we, with isolated teams, uh, each team's code base can be separated and each team has own development and deployment process uh, to increase the developer experience. Uh, developers should be able to develop while using this stable infrastructure code and APIs. For example, push notification, marketing tools uh, and camera APIs should be ready to use across the all developers. So uh, once we realized all of that uh, and understood how quickly we are growing, uh, we came to the conclusion that it won't be possible to achieve our dreams with a simple React Native structure. Let's talk about the technical part. Basically, uh, we divided monolithic application into all micro applications, as you can see in the main picture. Uh, firstly, we will talk about the general structure. Uh, then we are going to dive into details. Um, here the first thing that we should mention about is the core app. Uh, the core application is the entry point of the application and created from config file. Um, it contains all native part of the application, the native libraries, Android and iOS builds. And the second thing is micro apps. Uh, there are multiple micro apps as corresponding our different teams and they use the core application as dependency. They only contain JavaScript parts and use JavaScript libraries. If we talk about details, the core application is the entry point of the application and uh, when the app is opened, uh, index.js file is run firstly. It provides an infrastructure to micro apps by managing native libraries, uh, so developers can focus on their own logic. It loads and runs micro apps by config file. Uh, the important thing that we can mention about is core app contains Android and iOS builds. Uh, so micro apps can edit as a dependency and install the pre builds with their own development. It manages native libraries such as navigation, camera, push notification, or error handling. Uh, you can add any native and JavaScript libraries to core application and use them by micro apps. If you look at the package JSON of the core application, uh, you can see that all native libraries are managed. So you can decide main libraries such as navigation, push notification, error handling, uh, analytics, or whatever you want, and add your JS libraries. Uh, then you can add as dependency to core application. The main responsibility of the core application is loading micro apps. Uh, micro app manager class is used for getting micro app specific things like tabs, components, tags, uh, deep links, or any other things. Uh, you can expand this file according to your micro app needs. 
Uh, these parts are provided from microapps and we can describe as contract between core app and micro applications. We use React Navigation Library for routing in the application. Uh, the stacks are exported from microapp contract file and core application gets stacks of the microapp. The routing main structure is managed from core application. Um, if the micro apps want to use navigation, uh, they can use through the core application. Uh, all stack structure is completed on single page in the core application um, and micro apps can use navigation as in the monolithic. The other important thing about core application is app previews uh, for Android and iOS. Uh, it can hold different variants of previews and they are published with core application as npm package. The micro apps use these debug applications and app runs fast with other micro app development. Keeping debug builds in the core application provides a significant improvement in application load time. Uh, when we measure the running iOS secret, uh, the monolithic application load time takes more than a minute, as you can see, uh, but for micro app architecture, the load time takes less than 10 seconds. Uh, this, make, this makes it much easier the development environment. If you talk about the details uh, about the micro apps, each micro application has own independent business logic. Um, you can create screens in which um, API calls, utils methods, steps, or whatever you want from a uh, micro app uh, file. Uh, micro application has no native code, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, it contains only JavaScript parts. It has no direct communication, so it communicates with their own contract file through the core application. Actually, uh, each micro app has a micro app JS file, uh, and this file can be called contract of the micro app. Uh, the micro app exports its specific things uh, like methods, stacks, uh, deep links, components uh, from this file, and it communicates through core application by this file uh, with other micro apps. For communication between two micro apps, uh, you can export methods from one micro app uh, and the other micro app can use. For example, uh, you have a login micro app and you want to use login methods from dashboard. Uh, you can export your method that you want to use from login and dashboard can access this method uh, through core application and can use. If we take a look at micro app package JSON, uh, our JavaScript libraries are added as dependencies. Uh, we have our npm packages like components, globals, and uh, we use ready for deployment text for version. We are going to mention about tech part in the development and deployment section. Um, each micro app will have the latest version of the R package thanks to npm package. Uh, and if one micro app want to use the other one, it can add as dependencies. Uh, you can see the core application is added as dev dependencies uh, because we only use it on development and testing, not in production. And it is also added as peer dependencies for using the same version of the core application in the all micro applications. Another part of the micro app architecture is our JavaScript libraries. Uh, our components, uh, global definitions, util methods were in the main application repository before micro app architecture. Uh, then they were separated from monolithic application and created as npm packages for each of them. If one micro application needs the JS libraries, uh, it can use by adding as dependency. In our structure, we have an npm package for bridging all micro apps and the core application. Uh, we called it as main application. Uh, main application has a config file. Uh, this config file contains micro app imports, as you can see. Uh, we added the core app and micro apps as dependency uh, to main application. Uh, core application loads micro apps with the config file and we run and build application through this main application. On testing part, uh, we use uh, Gestan React Native testing library. Uh, our monolithic application, uh, we have two many test cases uh, because all domains are in one repository. 
When we divide into micro apps, each micro app has own test environment uh, and test cases run so fastly. For example, uh, in our monolithic application, when we run test cases, it takes almost 350 seconds. Uh, but when we run for account application, it takes almost 50 seconds. Obviously, it takes less time because it only has own test cases. Uh, this makes it much easier to run test cases in the development environment. So, okay, uh, let's see how it works our model development process. Developers are coding on code base uh, and pushing code to own repository. Uh, this will tri trigger uh, a testing part, all the unit tests or end to end tests running on a pipeline. And then uh, we are taking modules uh, with RT. RT tag, uh, that means ready for testing. If developers want to see new features uh, on application with other modules, uh, they, ne they need to build main application and distribute it internally. Um, when our product said that, okay, it's great, uh, let's release it to the, our users, uh, let's see how we do this. All the developers need to take uh, his well-tested and stable modules with RD, that means ready for deployment. Uh, and then we can build a main application with uh, all modules. After building the main application, we are publishing to Google Play Store and App Store beta programs. Uh, and then when our Q&A says everything is okay and stable after the smoke testing, uh, we can publish to Google Play and App Store. To wrap up in a summary, uh, we have 15 product teams with many developers uh, currently, uh, and all developers are JavaScript background. They are developing his features with just a JavaScript. And uh, we have clear infrastructure APIs across the teams, and we speeded up development cycles for a continuous development. Um, so we are running so fast, uh, as Dilara mentioned before. Uh, our build time and testing time is so fast according to the monolithic architecture. And we have platform team for develop the infrastructure and product oriented teams for develop the features. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can reach us with this information uh, if you have any question uh, or concerns. Uh, so see you at Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk about the micro app architecture. I feel like this might be a next big thing in React Native to create super apps that have micro apps in them. It's a good a piece of knowledge. Another talk ahead of us and the title is how to use React Native with NX in Monorepo. And this is by Emily from Narvel. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. My topic is React Native Monorepo. My name is Emily Shaw. So first, let me introduce myself. I currently live in Toronto, Canada right now, and I work for a company called Nowar.io. So our company has this open source software called Annex, which helps you to manage your Monorepo. I am a developer for the library Nava React Native and Nava Expo. I like hiking, biking, kayaking, and skiing. And I'm going to run a half marathon in October this year. So here is the topic I'm going to cover today. What is monorepo and what is NX? How to create an NX monorepo? How to do unit testing and doing testing? And how to add storybook to your React Native app? So here is a problem I have. For example, if my organization has multiple React Native mobile apps, they all have the common styling and they use the same components, how do I make a component library that's easily shared between all these different mobile apps? 
if I make change to my component library, how do I make sure all the consuming mobile app get it right away? Or this is a different problem I might have. For instance, for my organization, I have both mobile apps and web apps. I choose React Native as my mobile tech stack and the React as my web tech stack. So how do I share code between these two different tech stack? For example, I want to share some known UI code like state management basis logic. And I also want to have feature parity between my mobile and web app. Or this is a different problem I might have is my company has both front end code and back end code. They have the same interface and types. So how do I share interface and types between them? The solution I came up with is monorepo with NX. So first, what is a monorepo? I took this picture from the monorepo.tools website. It's also a website created by my company. So from the definition here, a monorepo is a single repository containing multiple distinct projects with well-defined relationship. So on the diagram here, there's a monorepo versus polyrepo. So for my monorepo, I only have one repository under my organization. And I can see all the apps and the library under it. And the apps and the library are linked. We have polyrepo where all my application using the same library here. However, the library is in its own repo and the whole application around it, they are in their different distinct repo as well. So there are definitely many monorepo tools out there that help you to manage the different apps and different apps and libraries for you. So they are all listed here. So what is NX? I also took this picture from NX website. So NX is smart, fast, and extensive build system. So all these are pretty big boards, right? And uh, it sounds good. But what does it do for me as a developer then? So why would I choose NX over other monorepo tools? So as a developer, I don't need to make additional configuration for unit testing, linking, and E2E testing. It will set up them for me out of the box. So I can start to write a code and start writing the React Native code right away rather than worry about configuration. You also have this feature called dependency graph where this is shows to you an interactive tool that allows you to see the relationship between all your applications and the libraries. So as the monorepo getting too big, as a developer, I would definitely worry about the speed, right? So how long would it take me to rebuild the entire workspace? So NX has this feature called computational caching, where if you make no change to your library application, you will retrieve the build from the cache rather than execute that rebuild task. So it definitely saves us a developer quite some time, provide us with fast build time. Same goes for unit testing and linting as well. So if you make no change in the code and you try to re unit, run the unit test or linting on your entire workspace, you will retrieve the task result from the cache rather than execute it. And it's pretty easy to share code. So let's create an NX workspace. Here, remember this problem we have? So in this example, we're going to create two mobile apps and make sure they share the same component library. So first, let's create an NX workspace. So in my terminal, enter the command npx create NX workspace at latest. So for my workspace name, I'm going to name it React Native EU. I'm going to create, use it with React Native. And I'm going to name my application mobile one here. So after installation is done, if you open your workspace in the, your code editor, 
you will see under the workspace root, I have apps folder and library folders here. If I expand my apps folder, I can see the mobile one application just created. If my if I expand the mobile one, I should see Android folder as folder source folder, which is the exact same structure of one single React Native app. So now we have one application in my workspace. Let's add another application. So I can using su command nx generate now React Native application followed by your application name. So if you use Visual Studio Code, there's an extension you could install here called NX Console. So it's a UI for NX. So instead of using the terminal and the run commands, you could use NX Console to generate now a React Native application. And for my application name, I can just enter Mobile 2 and I click the Run button here. So to run your application in the simulator or device. For Android, enter NX run Android followed by your application name. So in this case, it launches in the Android emulator. For iOS, enter NX run iOS followed by your application name here. So now we have two applications inside our workspace. Now let's create a shared library. So you can create in the NX console. So NX generate now a React Native library. So followed by my library name, I'm going to use a UI components here as my library name. And I click run button. Or you can use terminal and run the command here. NX generate now a React Native library followed by, followed by my library name. So now if you go to your workspace, on the apps, you can see the two applications we create, Mobile 1 and Mobile 2 here. On the libraries, you can see the UI component library we just created. However, there's nothing linked among them. So I can open my dependency graph by, NX, by entering an X graph. And uh, you should launch the website showing my dependency graph. Notice these three are kind of um, standalone, so they are nothing. They have nothing in common yet. So now let's create a component that could be shared. So I can do it inside a next console or generate now a React Native component. I'm going to name this component button, and I'm going to list it under UI Components Library, and I click Run here. Or I can use terminal where I can enter a next generate now React Native component followed by the component name button dash dash project equals to the UI components library dash dash export. Where with this flag, I can um, export the button files inside of index.ts here. So now, I can see that under UI components source library, there's a button folder created. And inside it, it has the button component and the unit test. So I can use this button component anywhere inside my mobile one and mobile two using the list import statement. So import button from the workspace name. So React Native EU followed by the library name, UI components. So if I use this import inside my mobile one app application and mobile two application and I run the dependency graph again, I will see something like this where mobile one and mobile two all imports from UI components library. So now we solve a problem one where we have a multiple mobile apps that can share component library. So here's another example we might have. So under my workspace, I have um, applications that use different tech stack. Then. And for instance, my mobile use React Native and my web use React. How do I share something like uh, same management or business logic code? So I do have this example under my GitHub. It's called Studio Ghibli Search Engine. 
So Studio Ghibli is a Japanese animation studio. So my application it allows you to search any films and characters created by this studio. So here are the libraries I use, which the which are complete to different text stack as I mentioned. So I use different material libraries for for these two applications here, and all the other libraries as well. So if I run a dependency graph, it currently looks like this. So I have web and the mobile, and they all share the three libraries. So store is for the state management, surface is calling the backend API, and the model is interfaces and types here. So to run it on the and um, for to run it on a mobile device, I can just run the next run Android, then my mobile app, and the next run LS, the mobile app here. So it launches my mobile app in the simulator or device to launch the web app here. Inside my workspace, I can just enter a next surf followed by my web app name. So still give this search engine web. So this should launches my web website inside the browser. So now we know how to create apps and libraries inside our workspace. As a developer, we all know that writing the application code is only half of the job. So the other half is testing. So let's see how do we do unit tests. So this is the unit testing library that we're going to use. For NX, these libraries are going to all installed for you as default. So you don't need to worry about, you don't need to worry about installation and configuration. So we're going to use Jest, testing library, Jest native, and testing library, React native. To run your unit test in terminal, enter NX test followed by your application name or library name. So for my case, I can and to NX has Studio Ghibli Search Engine Mobile here, and then you will pick up all the specs files. So any file has those specs, those TSX in it, and then you will run all the unit tests and show my unit test results here. So for the NX test command, you can also pass flags in. So the flag I use pretty often is watch flag, where every time you make a change, you will rerun the unit test in the background. So it's pretty useful if you are doing test driven development. There's other flags you can pass in with a next test. So I'll put the link here. So if you generate your component using like a next generate now React Native component, you will notice this various door spec file created for you. So this is the DOS spec file looks like. So I do have an example comparing a React unit test with React native unit test on the right. So they are kind of similar. So this is a simple component where it's just a loading spinner here. It doesn't have any props. So for my component, I'm just going to render it and check whether it renders successfully. So on the React unit test, it import the render function from testing library React, whereas React Native, you use um, the render function from testing library React Native. So this is a default unit test that's going to be created for you. So unit testing only testing the JavaScript logic for components only. So how about E3 testing? So for E2E testing, you will notice that for every application, there's a different folder ending with dash e2e create right beside it, right? So inside that e2e folder, it's going to use detox as the framework for unit test, for e2e testing. So what is detox? Detox is a gray box end-to-end -end testing and automation library for multiple for mobile apps. So I it's similar to Cybris before. So Cybris is uh, for the web application, and uh, they have some more similar syntax. So it's detox and Cybris. The test runner I'm going to use is Jest, and uh, 
If you need to set up Detox with iOS environment on your MacBook, you still have to install apps and utils library here. So how do you run it test? tests? On one terminal, enter a next star followed by your application name. So this will start the GI server here. And on the other terminal, you can just run the next test iOS and the next test Android followed by the utility folder name. So the next test iOS, your application name dash e2e will run the e3 test on the iOS simulator device. And next test Android, your application name dash e2e will run your end to end test on the Android simulator device. So how do I write the e2e test? Uh, I have an example here. So this is the e2e flow I got. So on the search input, I want to enter the text total rule here and I click the search button. So it should redirect me to a resource page where it shows me a list of films and characters related to this one. So I first I click the first item in the list and it shows me the movie detail where it shows showing me the, my neighbor turtle room movie. So I need to write the E3 test for this flow. So I do have a code snippet here. So first you wait for the search page to be visible. Then you get the ID of search input, clear text, and enter total rule inside the search input. Then you get search button and tap on the search button. Then it goes to the resource page. And I want to get the first item of the resource list item here. And I click that one. It should redirect me to the film page. And I get the title on the film page and it should equal to my title, my neighbor total rule. So this is a kind of snippet of the detox e 2 test. Last, I want to talk about storybook. So what is storybook? It's for UI development, testing, and documentation. So for storybook, it's pure presentational. We are going to pass some mock data into a storybook. So the component is pure, um, does not have any state and does not call any API or bank end. And the, the library we're going to use is Storybook React Native. So how do you add Storybook to the application? You can run this command, and next generate now a React Native Storybook configuration followed by your application name. So for this case, I'm just going to generate Storybook to my application Studio Ghibli Search Engine Mobile. And then I'm going to ch choose yes to add dot storage.ts file beside my components here. So after you run that command, you should see there's three folders created for you. So on the workspace rule, there's a dot storybook folder inside your application. There's also dot storybook folder. Also under source, there's a storybook folder as well. So how do you run the storybook? First, in the terminal, enter a next storybook followed by application name here. Then you should start your application like you normally run your app. app. So after you launch your application, either using run Android or run iOS, and launches in the Android emulator device or iOS emulator device, then you have to open the debug menu and then choose the last item in your debug menu. So toggle storybook here. So this is what you see. So notice it has a manual button. So click navigator, you should see your navigation list of different stories. And you can click the stories here and it shows you the detail of that component. So this is what those stories file look like. So I want to create a story for my film car component here. So and uh, I want to show primary and uh, I'm going to pass some mock data list into this film car component. So if you open your storybook here, you should see the film car primary and click it. 
it shows you the film count with the mock data you passed in. So that is the end of my presentation. I know I went through a lot today, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. You can reach through my Twitter, where it's pretty easy to remember. Just my last name shown, followed by my first name, Emily. Uh, you, also, you can also reach me at Nawa Community Slack here. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Emily. And now for our last subject of the first day of our conference, React Native EU 2022, building a full JS deep zoom image viewer from company RIA, Maxon's Harm. My name is Maxence and I am very pleased to give this talk for the 2022 edition of React Native EU. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone at Coldstack for this great opportunity and for this incredible event. Um, and I will be presenting a project that led us um, to build a, an image viewer with uh, deep zoom capability. Um, we will develop precisely what we mean by that uh, during the presentation and without writing a single line of code. So the result um, is basically a pure JS React component. Let me just start with a small illustration of the situation we faced. Um, as developers, we often ask ourselves if we should do something ourselves or use an existing piece of code. That is probably one of the questions that I find myself trying to answer the most. Um, the internet has a clear answer for that. It's always don't reinvent the wheel, uh, use what exists. There are numerous blog articles and forum answers stating that you always should use existing libraries, even if they are not matching your exact use case and so on. Um, okay, uh, well-maintained, well-tested framework used in thousands of production applications is certainly better than starting from scratch. There's no doubt about that. React Native is a prime example of that. Um, but what bothers me is how generic this answer has become. Uh, to take this illustration, yes, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, what if it doesn't match what I'm trying to do? Uh, or what it, if it's broken or it's not um, exactly what uh, I expect to be? Um, there are infinite types of projects and it's not the same to choose a framework for your whole app and choosing a library for a single uh, view or component that maybe some users will never see. Uh, it doesn't have the same importance and the same um, consequences. Um, so this talk is kind of a testimony of our journey exploring what the awesome React Native community had to offer in order for us to build a, compl a complex UI component. Um, and as you might have guessed uh, by now, we did not end up using what we started with. So I will be taking, uh, I will not be taking you to, <laughs> to Egypt today, but it has, um, this has to do with the deep zoom feature that uh, our image viewer needs to have, uh, which we already mentioned in the title of the talk. Uh, I think many of you have at least already heard about image pyramids or tile pyramids. Uh, I will explain the basics before we dive into it because uh, it is at the very center of what we were trying to d display today um, in, our, in our component. Um, I will be starting by introducing who we are and what we do, of course, as well as um, a small feature we had in our product and which is the starting point um, of the project I'm going to talk about. So basically that would be uh, the V0. Um, we will see together what the goals are for, um, for the, the V1. Uh, then we will see two different stages uh, in the project. First, uh, the proof of concept um, I did when discussing the project with, with a prospect to, cho to showcase what we were going to do. And uh, the phase of implementation in our production app. 
Uh, as I said earlier, we kind of changed the way we plan to do it between those two, uh, those two phases, and uh, I will explain why. Finally, uh, I will recap uh, what we achieved and uh, we still have to, what we still have to do in order to make, uh, to make it even better, as well as ideas for further use. So I have not yet introduced myself properly, so um, it looks like the right time to do it. My name is Maxence and um, I started a SaaS company with my wife a few years back. Uh, our offices are in La Rochelle in France and um, our product is meant to centralize and structure data for construction and renovation professionals. That means um, architects, interior designer, uh, general contractors, our goal is to give them the ability to easily work on and off site and on the go, losing less time in the process and making less mistakes. So it's basically a not in one solution, digital solution for construction professionals. Um, task management, time planning, cost tracking and analysis, um, stakeholder access and communication uh, through a feed, uh, report generation, floor plans and blueprints, uh, floor plans and blueprints will be uh, kind of uh, in the center of what we uh, will build together. Um, it has a web app as well as a mobile app. And um, about me, I had quite uh, an ordinary, an ordinary um, developer path, I would say, uh, starting 10, 15 years ago with static website, HTML, CSS, classic PHP, MySQL, then moving on to JavaScript and first mobile app using Ionic. I know nobody's perfect, but then I discovered React and never left. So I did some freelance stuff uh, at the start and worked for a startup company which develops add-ons for micro Microsoft Office. Um, sorry. Um, so that was in uh, .NET languages and frameworks. Um, Rea, this company uh, we are now uh, building, uh, started as a side project in 2017 actually, using React Native ver uh, version 0.34, uh, now it's on 64, so we are not yet fully up to date, but uh, that will come. Uh, I'm not, I would not say I'm an expert in React Native architecture, I contributed once to uh, the React Native CLI repo. Um, as I said, this talk is to show the great, thing, the great things we can achieve with the, with the tools at our disposal, uh, thanks to uh, the community as React developers. So let's head to it then. Um, so each project on the app has a feed to display activity as the project goes forward. Um, members of the project can post text and photos, link it to a particular task, um, add a marker on a blueprint like a floor plan uh, to show a precise location. This is uh, the initial mock-up for um, the V0 of, our, uh, of this feature. Um, so basically you have your feed, uh, you have your form at the top, uh, then you reach a, a full screen uh, form where you can add, uh, type some text, uh, add photos and so on. Now what we want is to locate it on a blueprint. Uh, so uh, we give the possibility to select uh, an image from the files of the project. Um, Uh, and that now is the most important view for this talk. It's the view where you can put your marker on the blueprint, um, the floor plan viewer. So in the V0, the blueprint is supposed to be a simple image, so JPEG or PNG, uh, and the implementation would be straightforward, but as you can see, the user interaction um, to mark the location does not involve to tap on the screen, but rather to move the, ima the image behind the fixed and, set and centered marker. Um, this is to give more precision to the user, uh, and it is often seen in applications when you order a ride or, uh, for example, uh, as you need to pinpoint your precise location on the street. So, and that's the end of the market when you 
finally publish your, your post. Um, so the initial version, as I said, uh, was only meant to support image formats. Um, so this is uh, why we decided, um, this was decided, sorry, because um, uh, it seems obvious how to implement it and it's not that hard to convert a PDF to an image uh, or export an image directly from CAD software. So it was a good entry point to this um, new feature uh, in our product. Um, you can see uh, here how it looks like uh, on the web, uh, for example. Uh, it's simply uh, an image on a, in a model and um, on the web the code is uh, fairly simple. Uh, here's uh, how it uh, mainly looks like. Uh, looks like. Uh, you have a container and a, with CSS positioning set to rel relative uh, and an image displayed within. Uh, you can then use uh, the click event on that image to get the coordinates of the click in pixels and store it in a state variable. And this then gives you the, pos the possibility to absolute position the marker component of your choice to view the mark location. You then just need to store this coordinate somewhere or send it to, uh, to your backend along with the rest of the form in order to, uh, to keep it for further use. Um, there's actually a bit more than that uh, in the real component, but really not much, uh, only some uh, ratio to, uh, to take into account the resizing of the image if it doesn't fit into the view or the model or something like that. Um, so it's simply dividing uh, the coordinates uh, by that ratio or multiplying it. Um, so that's fairly simple and quite straightforward for the web part. Uh, but what interests us is now the mobile one, which has a um, slightly complexer interaction. Um, on mobile, we could have easily done the same with uh, an on-press event uh, and absolute positioning for the marker. But as we said, uh, precision was important even for the V0 of this feature. So what we need is a simple pan and zoom image viewer, which we can track the center, from which we can track the center uh, uh, of viewport, uh, the center or the viewport position, in order to know uh, the current coordinates of the displayed marker, which is fixed in the center. Um, there are lots of gallery libraries and image viewers out there, uh, built upon native libraries, which, with great support. For, um, with great support for uh, image formats and um, which uh, have built-in uh, networking optimizations like prefetching and caching and so on. Uh, and we actually use one of those to display photos uh, in full screen when you tap uh, on it uh, in the feed or in the project files. But they are all uncontrolled components and they don't give you any API to access the current viewport. Um, it's all in the native part and does not come back up uh, into the JavaScript code. Um, so we, you, can't, you can't know um, what uh, is in this, what position has the center of the viewport uh, with, with these components. Hopefully, thanks to the community, um, there was a spot on example in the docs of reanimated V1 called Image Viewer. Uh, with pan and zoom capabilities as well as some bonuses like uh, bouncy edges and bouncy scale limits. We only needed to change the edge limits so that the edges could reach the center of the view, allowing to pinpoint right up uh, the edges. Uh, but let me show you. So let's take a look at this example. So, as you can see, we had some examples from the V1 of React Native Reanimated, and uh, that one was called Image Viewer and came with some initial built-in um, features like bouncing when you zoom too much or when you uh, take the edge of the the edge of the screen and so on. So um, that was really close to what we were looking for with a pinch gesture handler and a pan gesture handler that works sim simulta simu simultaneously. I got it. Um, so hop. 
a jump to the one in our app. Uh, so the code is basically uh, taken from the example and uh, as I said we only changed uh, sm very small parts to achieve what we were looking for. Um, so here I'm in an old project of ours on the application and we will take a look together up. So that's the image viewer from the example with some slight changes. As you can see it has this bouncing effect when you zoom out too much or when you zoom in too much. So that was basically it. Um, but the edges don't come back because we needed to be able to pinpoint some, something uh, right near the edge. So that's why, it's, that's why the bouncing comes back to the edge instead of going back to the side of the screen. Um, so that's what we had to change. Quite, quite straightforward. Uh, we can even have a look at the differences that we had to make and you will see that this example was really mega useful in our case. I just closed it instead of going to it up. So now if I save and if we take a look at what's changed. Okay, so it won't work anymore. That's quite expected. You can see that we actually added some throttle to get the position back and not too, ma not too much. Um, we changed some max scale and uh, yes that's because we now use reanimated v2 so background backwards compatibil uh, compatibility. The width and height are now calculated uh, by the components of both to, to make it uh, so it takes the whole screen and passed down to keep it working uh, and you can see it's about here so we have we've added some stuff right there but that's only the stuff to um, to make it a control component or at least to get information about uh, what the actual position is there is some debug stuff uh, but mainly yes that's mainly the width and height that are computed above and um, some styles and uh, this part here which were uh, where uh, the panning was stopped uh, at some point which we had to simply change a bit to uh, to change the condition uh, about when uh, when we had to, to change it to stop it so that's it for v0 quite straightforward thanks to the help of great projects. Um, let's move on now to the actual uh, more advanced uh, components that we have built. Um, we are now going to dive deep into image pyramids. So the V1 of our feature has some more requirements for the input uh, which is supposed to which it is supposed to handle. Um, so same image support as uh, V0, uh, JPEG and PNG. Um, we need PDF support uh, for single and multi-page, but this does not specifically affect our viewer as we decided to treat each page as separate blueprint and the processing is uh, done on the back end. So we will still have uh, the same uh, output uh, for our viewer. Um, we need to handle big uh, and complex floor plans. Um, big means mainly for raster uh, which, uh, images, um, 
they might be several thousands of pixels wide and tall so that would be uh, something to take into account and complex because for PDFs um, we've had to uh, discussions with a prospect um, who had uh, huge uh, blueprints with very detailed vector graphics uh, and that would need a lot, a lot of time to render and that might uh, cause some problem as well. So that's an example of a blueprint that was uh, given to us to to use for testing. Um, and uh, all of that needs to be done with a high precision, high precision of zooming uh, in order to be able to locate uh, uh, markers very precisely. So uh, on the performance aspects, uh, we need to focus on three things. Uh, first is the load time on site downloading and viewing should not require to wait uh, when there's a, a decent connection. Um, we actually prepared an offline ca capability for the proof of concept, but we did not bring it to production yet. Um, interactions, um, well, 60 frames per second is always the goal for reactive feeling. Um, and memory, uh, low-end devices should not run out of memory, uh, so it was tested on an old Android tablet, which, has, which was known uh, to have difficult time rendering PDFs like the one on the previous slide. Um, so given all the requirements for the input and the performance of uh, our feature, um, a naive, naive evolution of V0 did not seem to meet uh, the requirements, uh, considering what we had to do. Um, what I mean by uh, an evolution of V0 would be um, like a controlled native PDF viewer component with a an on position changed and an on zoom prop, for example. But um, we would we would need to make to be sure that the marker is placed in the center plus. We don't know how it would handle large uh, number of vector details uh, and so on. Uh, and um, there are not many uh, PDF viewers like that which send back uh, uh, their position uh, and so on, like for the image galleries. And second, we, we could also uh, keep our Im image viewer and convert PDFs to image, but then downloading reservations uh, for big blueprints could be really slow, uh, if not impossible. So that's what that's why we went for uh, image pyramids that we will see right now. Um, there are several formats for image py pyramids like uh, Deep Zoom, Zoomify, Google, but the core principle remains the same. Uh, the original file is split into square tiles. Um, so the original file would be the bottom layer on the on the, the examples that you can see. Uh, a new level, new level is created with half the width and half the height split into tiles like the previous. So the number of tiles uh, is divided by four on each stage. And you repeat that until your, the image fits into one tile. This uh, is really great because it gives you a predictable maximum number of pixels to load for a given viewport and tile size. Um, the viewport size depends on the size of the view or the screen and the pixel ratio of the device. Uh, tile size, on, on the other hand, is uh, defined by our, our processing uh, on the back end and has a fixed value. Um, so the proof of concept we, was made to validate our ability to develop this feature completely, which meant back end processing, serving of tiles, as well as front-end, web and mobile components to display and interact with the pyramids. Uh, the pyramids are in fact very common in our day-to-day -to -day tools. All navigation apps use it to display maps as tiles, loading them when needed. Each time you zoom in or out or move the map around, you see, you see it loading when you have a bad connection. Um, here are a few examples. So OpenStreetMap uh, uses leaflet. Hop which is a great JS library for displaying uh, image tile pyramids. So you can see the tiles loading. And uh, um, not on the map side, we also have stuff like OpenSeaDragon, Open which is uh, an image viewer for high resolution image viewer. So you can zoom really, really, really deep into the image. So 
uh, the real life example of Open Sea Dragon on an art website is this one. Up. Yeah, you can see as well, it can really zoom in really deep. So these are some examples of uh, deep zoom image viewers on the, on the web. As you can see, if you look into the Chrome developer tools, you see the, the request URL for the tiles, which has often uh, um, uh, this kind of, uh, of URL. Okay, sorry, I went too quick. Hop, just get back there. There it is. So that's the kind of uh, URL you get for uh, these uh, tile pyramids. Uh, on the mobile side, we have found uh, this project, with, which is an iOS uh, deep zoom image viewer, uh, which is kind of the same as OpenSea Dragon from what we could see. You see that you can really zoom deeply, zoom deeply sorry, in a, into the image, um, which could be what we were looking for. And also we have found a, an article uh, from someone trying to do something uh, pretty similar with, with what we were trying to achieve, as you can see with this uh, floor plan, and we had done it in, uh, in Expo using React Native Maps. So um, yes, there, there are a lot of stuff uh, around the uh, image pyramids uh, uh, and maps. We are not uh, using a, a map or navigation system, but um, it looked actually to be the best uh, direction to go. So we did our proof of concept using React Native Maps, and I will show you how right now. So as I was saying, um, on the web part, Leaflet was the decided solution, and on the mobile, uh, the solution uh, with the React Native Maps was what the way we decided to go, um, as there is no um, version of Leaflet made for uh, mobile, uh, no native version of Leaflet, um, and we wouldn't really want to use uh, to use it in, inside a web view. So let's see it. Hop. Where did I put it? Okay, right there. Um, so that was our initial version, and we are now going to take a look at the proof of concept that we made using React Native Maps. If I can find. I think it's this one, yes. Okay, so um, you can see here on the right what the result looks like. Up. So that's React Native Maps. Uh, you can see it on the bottom. We still have the Google logo, uh, which is not ideal, but we'll discuss that later. And um, we were able to display our floor plan and add markers to it using this component and having this tile pyramid display correctly and functioning all right. So on the code side, I just wanted to show you So on the code part, you can see um, that we are using React Native Maps. It's not very a very big file. It's quite easy to use as well. So the harder part of React Native Maps is mostly uh, getting, getting it to build inside your own, uh, inside your own uh, application. But um, we use uh, the component map view. You can see that we have some 
uh, props so provider we use the Google provider so that we can use it uh, you can use the same on uh, iOS and Android uh, because we could have used uh, the Google Maps SDK on uh, Android and then the uh, Apple Maps on uh, on iOS but then we would have, we would have faced maybe uh, specific problems from one or the other so that way we at least have the the same provider uh, on both sides. Map type n map map type known uh, is made is used because we don't want to display um, the Google Map tiles, but instead we want we want to use uh, our custom tile layer. So we have a URL tile uh, inside of our map view, which we will provide our uh, URL template. So. Uh, the URL template, you can see it at the top of the iPad on, on the side. Uh, it's mainly uh, a URL where you put your coordinates, um, your tile coordinates. So uh, uh, Z will be the zoom level. So the zoom level zero is where you have only one tile. Then uh, one you have four and so on. Uh, and Y and X are the coordinates of the tile within uh, this level. So uh, that's what we provide here to, to display it, the tile size uh, that we use. And you can see that you can have a, a minimum zoom level and a maximum zoom level so that it stops zooming when you have reached uh, the resolution of your, of your image. Um, so it works quite well. We can even uh, add markers by using the onlong press uh, but as we talked about uh, earlier that's not the final interaction that we want to have and that might uh, come with uh, problems uh, later on uh, so to recap quickly up to recap quickly on um, on this component uh, this proof of concept for using um, reactive maps uh, as our component, um, as our library for, for this uh, image viewer. Um, you can see that uh, it works quite well uh, as the Google Maps SDK is uh, uh, evidently uh, working well with the uh, tile pyramids. Um, we have uh, achieved to add markers and display them, uh, but we still have the Google logo and um, we have tried, I didn't show you that, but uh, we even have tried, uh, started to try to put our own uh, interaction as you, as we, we showed earlier with the marker uh, centered in the, um, on the view, if it wants to refresh. Yes, you should see it now. Up. We started this so here it is so we started to position a marker and try to get the the region from the displayed region from the the map view but that was not ideal as we needed in fact to hide that Google logo that we couldn't uh, do otherwise that uh, with with some um, uh, with some hack uh, by setting a, a a position in the bottom and hiding it by making it overflow, but then we have to compensate the location of the marker in the center. And we started to as we started to try to make those small details uh, about interaction uh, and how we wanted our component to 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 feel. Um, uh, we started to see that it was really not made for. For that use and what it was really made to to display maps and, uh, and not something else um, so let's get back to the presentation and move on so as i said some time later we managed to plan the integration of the um, of this project into our production uh, production app yeah it was uh, intense because uh, as we find grain the viewer of the um, on the web with leaflet we realized that react native maps did not offer the same conveniences 
and we started to struggle to achieve the experience we wanted to give to our users. Um, so some drawbacks that we had with uh, React Native Maps um, were that, uh, well, it was not well suited for the custom tiles, so we were able to specify a, a URL tile, but uh, there we still needed a Google account registra registration to use the SDK. We still had the Google logo. Um, maybe that was some kind of bug. I, I'm, I'm not sure we had to verify and check, but uh, I think the Google Maps, uh, Google Maps tiles were still needed in the background, um, were still uh, requested and uh, fetched in the background. Um, the position selection uh, UX, as we just saw with the the centered marker was not uh, really easy to, to achieve with that uh, Google logo uh, hack. Um, and most of all, we, there was a, a really inadequate uh, coordinate system uh, for positioning the markers. Um, it uses the Mercator projection, uh, which makes distance uh, scales as you go away from the, the equator line. Uh, for example, the 100 kilometer uh, line at the top of the world, uh, at top north, uh, would be much bigger than the same uh, distance uh, around the equator. So uh, use it, uh, latitude, using latitude and longitude um, would not be considered uh, for storage in our database. Uh, for those uh, marker coordinates, it wasn't logical. Uh, so we would need to convert it to display it and to convert it back uh, when, we, when we want to store it uh, each time. And uh, it was really not, really not um, um, convenient uh, to use it like that. Uh, mo uh, there is, m there are many, many uh, things in the API of React Native Maps that are uh, uh, really made for maps uh, and not for something else. It's logical, but uh, it's not uh, uh, ideal for us uh, in this uh, particular case. And uh, finally, the maintainers were um, not having the time to address issues and. Uh, uh, that did not uh, play in favor uh, of, us of us choosing the library. Uh, since then, the, it has been um, uh, changed and uh, some people are uh, uh, actively working to, to, to maintain it. And uh, it's, it's still a great library, but we just thought that uh, it was not uh, perfect for our use case. So all of this uh, led us to the decision to, ma uh, to move away from native maps. Uh, but what were the alternatives that we had? Um, native modules, uh, as we saw uh, earlier, uh, there was one uh, for iOS, but uh, it's hard to find separate projects with similar functionality and equivalent quality, maturity. Uh, at least uh, with React Native Maps, we were using Google Maps SDK um, on both platforms. Um, and uh, also, I don't have much uh, experience with native mobile uh, development, so if we had to dig deep into the library code to understand some stuff, uh, it was not really... Uh, um, practical. Uh, since I had used uh, Ionic in its early days, uh, I had experienced some weird stuff due to the default behavior of web views regarding interactions. Uh, it made the app UX feel really poor, so I tried to avoid it as much as possible, especially as a, on a component with such specific uh, interaction needs. So um, using Leaflet in a web view wasn't really uh, uh, an option as well. Uh, we already had part of the solution with our initial image viewer. Uh, what we needed from there was to display uh, a layer of tiles instead of a single image. Uh, the more I thought about it and the more it seemed straightforward st straightforward, sorry, to replace one with the other. Um, translations are nothing more than basic geometry. <laughs> well, the, the geometry in the end was actually the, um, the part where we lost the um, uh, the, the more time uh, because uh, when you combine translations on multiple layers uh, you start losing track of what is what but in the end um, it paid well and uh, it paid well and we managed to achieve what we wanted um, the new reanimated API is much clearer, clearer to use uh, in the first component we used the v1 and um, the v2 is actually compatible with the v1 so we can have legacy, our legacy component still working while uh, we migrate uh, all existing data so that was uh, really gr a great thing for us um, let's see how it looks like for the final production component so i don't have much time left so i will be uh, quite quick, but that is um, the latest version then of our plan viewer. Um, what you can uh, see 
here is that we um, used, in fact, um, uh, like in the previous version, uh, the V0, uh, a container view to handle positioning of the image layers and re um, reacting in response to gestures detected by the gesture handlers. Uh, so that is basically a transcription from V1 image viewer to the V2 API of reanimated. Um, uh, tac, 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 tac. As you can see in the JSX, we still have uh, a view and then our gesture detector uh, around an animated view and then inside of that uh, we will have uh, our tile layer component and our markers. Um, so the way this uh, container f um, is uh, the behavior of this container is really close to what we had before in our image viewer, um, and inside of that uh, we have the tile layer, uh, which is responsible for uh, positioning the tiles um, in uh, relative to this container. Uh, that means uh, to. Uh, display the zero zero uh, in the top left corner and then uh, the ones uh, after that. So we have a first uh, level of translations uh, in the style. So uh, now in the reanimated V2 we use uh, a helper which is called use reanimated styles. I will find them. So uh, to come to the top of the component, uh, at the top we initiate uh, initialize some uh, basic constants, so uh, the scale. Uh, we have it uh, as a shared value, which is um, a, uh, an animated value from, uh, from reanimated V2, and uh, also as a, as a state, because we will need to, uh, to get it back uh, in the JS to, to store it afterwards. So um, uh, the same thing for zoom level, uh, which will also have a, a shared value version, an animated va value version, and uh, uh, a state value. Uh, a state value. Uh, we have uh, also the viewport. So we have two viewports. The main viewport, which is um, the pixels or, or points uh, of the displayed area, and the tile viewport, which we will use to uh, store the coordinates uh, of the visible tiles, uh, because we will um, we have added some virtualization to avoid uh, uh, memory uh, explosion. <laughs> so we uh, will compute uh, the visible tiles to only display them. Um, and that is used in the tile layer component. Um, the rest here, uh, offset start, uh, focal offset, uh, scale to top left fix, and, and so on. That's the same as uh, we had in the, the image viewer. Uh, to uh, position the, the container, um, depending on the pan and zoom that we applied uh, before. And uh, <coughs> as you can see, uh, that's the gesture handlers. That's also a transcription from, uh, from before, from the previous version. And uh, then that's it for the structure of the, the component. Um, the markers as well are uh, displayed um, relative to, to the container. So let's see how it looks like. So I have uh, the same uh, plan as in the proof of concept, and we can see that uh, we are able to achieve something really similar. Uh, so we see, we see it uh, loading sometimes and so on, but uh, here we have uh, uh, really our own component that you, we can use uh, um, and uh, and modify and we are not dependent on t on uh, Google Maps SDK or, or such uh, such things. So uh, I can choose to point here, for example. Uh, that's okay, but I can also use uh, a huge. So I will only be able to modify it on the same. Oh. Sorry, misclicked. Hop. I'll delete it and add another one. And then we will open this huge plan that I will be able to also quite efficiently navigate. So um, that's the final version that our users are actually using. Um, so we can add marker, uh, we have a, a debug mode for viewing the viewport, but that I don't won't have the time to show you 
right now. Uh, we will get on with the end of the presentation. Hop. So what next? Um, uh, the main part of the component is really uh, functional. It uh, operates well uh, with our users. Um, there are still some missing parts like uh, double tap to zoom or go to coordinates in order to to animate it um, uh, dynamically. Um, the bouncy uh, pinch and uh, and uh, pan uh, we do not have the time to transcribe it from uh, the V1. Uh, so that would be a um, good thing to good things to add. Um, we could also add a better uh, virtualization uh, from for the um, the mounting and unmounting of images uh, that is sometimes visible. Uh, we have a drop in the frames per second because we uh, send it back to JS. So we have minimized uh, our uh, exchange bet between uh, native code and JS, but we need we still need in the states um, the state of the component to have the visible tiles, the current zoom level, and uh, that's pretty much it, I guess. Uh, so this uh, always calls um, the JS uh, engine, so that's always a little drop in the, in the performance. Um, but what uh, really would be interesting, I guess, uh, would be to see if that could uh, be a um, building block for maybe a pure JS maps library. Uh, so now that React Native Maps is uh, maintained again, uh, it's not uh, as important, but uh, that could be uh, an idea for the future of this uh, of this component. Uh, for now, it's not open source; it's still in in, in our uh, in our project. But uh, if anyone is interested in uh, how we did it and uh, using it for uh, something else, we might uh, consider making it uh, open source. So. Don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions about this talk or the project that uh, I just uh, explained to you. And uh, thank you for listening and uh, cheers. Thank you so much for this last talk. Of the first day of React Native EU 2022. What a day. A huge inspiration, but all good things must come to an end, so as the first day of React Native conference. Thank you all for today. Thank you for your talks and for your presence and support and love on social media. Tomorrow there is an amazing lineup of speakers waiting for you, so be sure to make it. See you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Wrocław time at the second day of React Native EU 2022. Brought to you, of course, by Colstack. Thank you.